strange in me Come to meet the strange in me To dig in deep Whatever I see I've come to meet the strange in me I've come to find an untamed love Come to find an untamed love To push and shove With the road gear Hi, welcome to Longmont Startup Week. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, our session today is uh, really an exciting topic because I know so many people have had so many questions around this topic. Um, we are going to talk about um, intellectual property, intellectual property 101, patents, all, times, all types of great things. Our speaker today is Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Kimberly McKee. I am the executive director of the Longmont Downtown Development Authority here in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, we manage the downtown district and are thrilled that this uh, is coming to you live from downtown Longmont at Longmont Public Media with our wonderful partners here. We also have Eric Drennan with us here today. He is from Holzer Patel Drennan, Intellectual Property and Business Law. Um, he has great experience, and I'm going to kick it over to him to introduce him, himself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kimberly. Let me uh, go ahead and share here. All right. While he's doing that, I will tell you there has been lots of time that I have worked in my life, whether it be for nonprofit, government, uh, for profit. There are always questions around intellectual property, around copyrights, around trademarks, what you should and shouldn't do, and how far you should go. Uh, it's something that we're always wondering, do we seek legal counsel? It, when is the best time? Probably to talk to people beforehand as opposed to after. Yeah, I know that our legal counsel always appreciates when we ask the question before it becomes an issue. So I think that this presentation will spell it out um, in a 101 level uh, where we can all understand it. So Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kimberly. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, as Kimberly mentioned, I'm an intellectual property attorney. Yeah, uh, I, I practice, practice in all areas of intellectual property, although you, you'll find throughout the presentation my, my, my depth of knowledge goes a little deeper on the patent issues than, than the other issues. But I can, I can speak to a lot, of, uh, a lot of the general issues and questions you may have on, on all areas of intellectual property. Uh, I, I've got a background in mechanical engineering, so that, that kind of suggests the patent end of my work. Uh, but I've been doing this work for almost 15 years now, uh, and uh, I get really excited about helping businesses, particularly startups, small businesses, try to figure out uh, strategies and uh, well, strategies for protecting their intellectual property. So that's really the focus of the, the conversation today is, is intellectual property 101, but really, really directed at startups and small businesses. And, and what can you do just getting started to protect yourself? Great. I do want to mention to everyone, if you have any questions, since this is a very robust topic, if you have questions um, while Eric is going along, go ahead and put those in the Q&A, and I will be glad to monitor that and ask him if it's uh, during the presentation. We're fine with that, so we can make sure we answer your questions as we move along. Um, so, Eric, tell us, how do we figure out if it's worth it, if we need legal, legal counsel, and what we should do moving forward? Yeah, uh, the, I mean, that, that really is the question, and, and it's a, really this whole presentation is the answer. <laughs> um, so so I'll, just, I'll just kind of start walking through it. Um, but, but I will, I will uh, second Kimberly on, if you have questions, put them in the chat, and she's going to feed them to me as they're, you know, as they're appropriate for the, for the conversation that we're talking about. The, it normally works a little bit better that way than saving everything from the end. So let's see here. So, so to talk about intellectual property law, you really have to start with what is intellectual property and, and intellectual creation. And I, I have an analogy that I like to use that, that, that helps frame, frame that issue a bit. And I like to think of intellectual creation as this vast uh, open space uh, of land, right? And it has various features. It has mountains and rivers and trees and, and, and ponds and, and, and what have you. And the, the vastnessness, the, the almost limited, uh, unlimited uh, uh, amount of that space, or at least as it appears, is what 
intellectual creation is like because it's 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 unlimited it's whatever you can come up with it's creations of the human mind and uh, and, and it's it's vast, and it has different. There's different types of creations that you could come up with that, that are that are analogous to the different features you might find on a on a vast piece of, of land. I also like the analogy because it, it, it land it can be property, right? Or it can be thought of property, and so is intellectual creation can be thought of property. The 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 limitation or or not some limit, limitation but the the law does not work so well with the with unlimited uh un, undefined quantities such as this uh this example of of property so in terms of uh you know of the law we really have to divide it up into into categories and i refer to those in this in this analogy as fences so there's different fences that you can put on that property to protect uh various features that you may intellectually create your intellectual creations um, so so why does it matter the, the reason that this matters is that intellectual creation if it's valuable and you put it out there in the public space without any sort of legal protection for that it's really free for anyone anyone to use and may use in a way that you didn't intend it or in a way that you would have wanted to do yourself, but someone else did it anyway. So that's that's why this matters, and I think I think most people understand that. So I'm going to move on to really, you know, okay. And this was really Kimberly's question, right? You have something, you think it's worthy of protection, but you don't know how to go about that. You don't know when to go about that, and you don't know what the different options are. And and as I mentioned, really, the law functions in, in, in specificity. It, it, you have to have definite meets and bounds in almost every area of intellectual property or any area of law and, and intellectual property just being one example of that. So the way intellectual property works is you have these different uh, ways that it gets carved up. In the, in the analogy, these are the different types of fences that you could put around your intellectual creations that are out in this vast open space. So you've got four main categories. You've got trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and, and patents. And those four categories of intellectual property protection, really that's 90, 95% plus of the, uh, of, of the available options to protect your intellectual property. There are some others. There are, I guess I would call them minor categories that uh, that are they're worth noting as well, and I have a slide directed to, to that at the end of the presentation. But the what the attorney does usually is take whatever concept, whatever inter, in, intellectual creation that you have come up with for your business, for your startup, and and try to fit them in some of these categories and see how they fit, if they could fit, and and what sort of protection that would give you. The the. Uh, the fifth bullet point on this slide is, is, is not in a category of intellectual property, but it is as important, if not more important, than, than the four above. Because agreements and contracts control title and ownership and control of your intellectual creation, your intellectual property, regardless of what other category that it, that it, that it slots in. So it's important to be thinking about your uh, your uh, what your, your contractual obligations, either your own or a, a, a contractor or an employee or whomever that is created on your behalf, because the origin of ownership in intellectual property always starts with the creator, the inventor for inventions, the artist or, or, or author in case of copyrighted works and so on and so forth. So that may be you for your startup and in that case that's fine, but what if it's an outside uh, uh, marketing or, or engineering firm? You don't own that automatically. It needs to be, title needs to move to you by virtue of contract. So that's why I put it there because it's important to note right up front that you need to understand who created whatever you're trying to protect and did title move from them to you or your, or your startup business? Quick question. We have a question from the audience. As an entrepreneur in early stage formation of our business, when is too early to engage an IP attorney? So, that's a complex question, but the, the the general answer would be you'd want to at least talk to an intellectual property. Most of us will have a conversation, you know, first conversation 
uh, without charging you. We, we, we believe in what we do, so we, we will have that conversation. But to preserve all your rights, you really want to have that conversation before you go public with anything that you've created or you share it outside of your yourself and maybe your close family. And, and so that's a, a version of going public. But even I guess the, I make that distinction because sometimes people think public is just publishing on the Internet or at a trade show or something. But even disclosing it to a handful of people that aren't under obligation of secrecy, you can lose some rights. The other thing to, to keep keep track of is when you first offered for sale, sale or sold your your in the case of patents or your technology the the others this this is less important really patents is the one that you want to think about closely in terms of talking to an intellectual property attorney before you publicly disclose or put on uh, put put out there for sale the other the top two categories trademarks and copyrights don't have those kinds of limitations so you don't necessarily have to get to the attorney that quickly um, of course, I, I, I would say sooner rather than later is always good to at least have the conversation. And then trade secrets, you want to have that conversation too, because if, if uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but in terms of trade secrets, once something's no longer secret, it's no longer protected under that body of law. So you need to understand what you need to be doing to keep something secret. So the rest of the presentation, I've just kind of walked through the different categories on the, on the prior slide. So let's start with, with the trademarks here. So trademarks are source identifiers. So the point of a trademark is you've got uh, you know a color in in the case of Owens Corning uh, you know pink insulation. You've got perhaps a, a trade dress on a shape like the the shape of a Coca Cola uh, bottle, or a a logo like the the McDonald's arches that I have at the bottom of the screen here. So you have some uh, you know what did I say words slogans symbols so on and so forth that identify a source of your, your product or service. Um, and, and that could be a variety of different things. I've given you a few examples here, but the key is the source uh, identifier part of, 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 the, of the trademark. And, and to that point, I made a, you know, a note in, in the slide deck that you want to think of trademarks as adjectives, not nouns. So they describe something. So if you want to be proper, you Google search something. Right, Google or even Google brand search something. You don't Google it, uh, and people say that all the time. And if that becomes uh, well, if Google permits it to become commonplace, and there's really no pushback on that, a trademark can become generic over time. So you want you want to think of your trademark as an adjective describing whatever generic product or service service that you sell. And over time, you want to police it. Now, as a startup, that's not something that you're going to need to worry about a lot. But I think it's important to have that mindset when you're defining what your brand is, particularly if it's a if it's a word or collection of words and not use those things generically, because that's not what you, what you want, particularly if you're coming up with something that's really new in the marketplace. People may be inclined to refer to whatever you're whatever you're selling in terms of a product or service by your brand alone. Uh, the next thing, uh, I get this question a lot where people ask, was well, it a service mark or is it a trademark? Is it in, in trade dress is another, uh, another term that's tossed around. And, and this is not really, this is, a, this is not really a distinction and it really doesn't matter that all, all of these different terms are enveloped under trademark law. Uh, service marks typically refer to if you're, if you're selling services, you would have a service mark, but it's a trademark as well. So it's not something to worry about. And then trade dress is also more directed at like the Coca-Cola bottle where you have a shape or, or, or an appearance of something rather than a word or a phrase or a, a logo or something like that. So something that it comes up a lot, but I wouldn't worry much about that. It's all trademark. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, one thing that Kimberly mentioned with the last question was when do you approach, uh, approach an attorney? And what's good about trademark law is if you don't approach an attorney, you don't have these conversations right up front, you're not, you're not out of luck. So you, trademarks are protected uh, as soon as you're using them in commerce. So as soon as you put a product out there in commerce or a service out there in commerce, you have protection over whatever branding you're using to, uh, to, you know, to identify that you're the source of that product or service. And that protection starts from that date under common law, and it extends for as long as you have that, 
uh, you, you use that branding for your product or service. Now, here, here's the gotcha. So, so the, the natural response to that is, well, why do I need to talk to an attorney at all? I mean, if I just use it, I've got protection under common law and I can just do that forever. And that's not untrue. The issue with that is, is without searching, without registration, you don't really know that you can even have that trademark because trademarks are all about senior users. So if there's a more senior user that's been in commerce longer than you, then they have priority over you. And they may not have exactly the same mark, but they may have one similar enough that that causes issues under the law. And what can happen and does happen is that companies will will move forward with their business plan. They're doing great. They're selling lots of product. They're putting a lot of money into marketing and, and so on and so forth. And then they get a letter in the mail. Once they get big enough to catch the attention of maybe a competitor a few states over or, or what have you, and they may have to rebrand because that's a senior user with a, and their mark is confusingly similar to that senior user. So while you don't have to approach an attorney right up front with this, you should think about at least having the conversation pretty early on to determine whether you want to put a lot of resources into protecting the uh, the mark that the, the, the trademark that you've selected because you may not be able to have that trademark uh i i uh, so that, that so that's common law that's just automatic protection registration there's a few different options for registration. So at the state level, it's really, it, it's just a, a notice thing because there's no examination at the state level. You can file a trademark registration in, in Colorado, for example, and this is common uh, across most, if not all the states, where they'll take, you'll take your fee and it's a nominal fee and give you a registration. And that's perfectly fine and good. And it puts people, other people on notice out there in the world that you're using and claiming that trademark. But they don't examine it. They don't tell you that it's truly valid. They just tell you that it's registered. So that's why at some point, if you're, you know, if you're really serious about protecting your trademark and your branding, you really want to do the national registration. And assuming we're, we're in the U.S., you, you look at the USPTO for that. And what's different between the USPTO registration and, and, and a state level registration is that they examine it and they, they do a comparison, they do searches, there's trademark examiners that they look at it and they compare it to everything else they can find. And assuming that they, that they find it not confusingly similar with some other mark out there that is in a similar goods, goods and services that, you, that you're in, they will grant your trademark application. And now it's presumed valid. And that gives you some confidence that you can put more money into marketing, you can put more money into really building that brand because you, you're fairly confident due to that registered trademark that you can truly protect it. Another quick question for you. Yeah. If there is a similar mark out there that has been inactive, how confident should we be to pursue without modifying any further? So, so that that depend, that really turns on a lot of the facts. But the thing to do, if, so if there's a registered trademark out there and you don't think that it's in, uh, you know, in commerce, then often the thing to do is to wait a bit and see what happens. Because the the trademark registrations, you have to renew them every ten years. So I don't know when that mark was filed, but if it was filed maybe eight years ago, then you know, then you might wait a couple of years and see if it just drops off, and then that senior user goes away. Now, another scenario, right, is that it maybe it was only filed a couple of years ago. There is something called a, an intent to use uh, a trademark application. So, so maybe it's not yet in commerce, but a competitor is getting ready to put it in commerce. So in that scenario, they do have senior rights by, by the filing date. Now, there's some rules in terms of how how quickly and how they, they execute on their actual use of that mark in commerce. And, and that's, that's a bit of a rabbit hole to go down here. But if that's the case, you really should talk to an attorney about what's the viability of your mark versus that mark. And if it's not in commerce, what's the likelihood that, you know, it, that, that, the, that, that the owner might be preparing to go to, uh, go to market or not? You can sometimes look up the business that owns that mark and determine if they're still, you know, paying their fees at the, at the registration level at whatever state they're uh, incorporated or organized under that might give a hint as to whether they're getting ready to go to market or maybe they gave up. Uh, it's just too many facts to know the answer. So you've really got to dive in a bit on that question. And one more quick question. Does trademark also protect taste? 
<laughs> um, that's a good one. And, and, and I think, uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that. I think that it would because a smell and a taste is kind of analogous in a lot of ways, right? And I know you can do smells. The issue with both smells and taste is figuring out, is defining that taste, right? And what is your taste versus someone else's taste? Actually, I think I'm looking at the, the Coca-Cola bottle on the screen here thinking, you know, maybe that's kind of an analogous thing where Coca-Cola, you know, the traditional example is they have this, we'll, we'll get to, uh, you know, to trade secret in a minute, but they have the secret recipe, right? That's locked up in a vault somewhere at their headquarters. And a lot of that's mark, more marketing fluff than actual hard law at this point, but it, it does work for, for an example. And I think there is some law behind that. And to the extent that there is a a list of an ingredients for a recipe in a in a you know uh, 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 you know formula for making Coca Cola, and to the extent it's it's secret, that's a good way to protect something that tastes a particular way. Um, the the kind of recipe uh, format. The caveat is that if someone can reverse engineer that recipe, then it's not trademarked and that's or that it's not protectable so that goes back to the coca-cola example that i think is good because there's tons of other cola competitors out there right some some of which your you know your store branded things are, are probably directed at tasting as much like coca-cola as they can fathom um and so so coca-cola protects that by having a trade secret on the formula they don't have a trademark on the taste again i think it's it'd be difficult to define what the taste really is versus a chemical formula of what the underlying you know components are yeah that's 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 an interesting one so the next okay so the next thing about trademark is choosing a protectable trademark and startups and small businesses often get this kind of confused and, and not wrong but their their tendency is to pick descriptive and generic marks because it describes whatever service or product that you're selling. There's a tendency to do that particularly early in the market because you want to get out the market and you want to show you want to not not just sell stuff but you want to explain to the market what your product or service is and you can do that in the title. So that's a tendency is descriptive and generic marks. However, the problem with that is those are generally not protectable marks. So, so on the screen, if you're looking at this, these, 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 I've got four categories, and they, they go from most protectable to not protectable from top, top, top to bottom here. And this is important because I think particularly for a startup small business, you may not have a lot of you know, resources, again, to talk to attorneys. So you really want to think about these things if you're going to go without, at least at first, and try to pick a mark that at least has a shot at being protectable. So I'll just, I'll just walk through these really quick. So, so you've got arbitrary or fanciful. So these are trademarks that are either nonce words, you know, things that aren't actually words at all, like Kodak, or a, a word that's, uh, that, that is a word, Apple, but it has nothing really to do with the product or services you're selling. In this case, Apple computers, right? Apples have really have nothing to do with computers, absent Apple computer, Apple branded computers. That's arbitrary or fanciful. Generally protectable marks, assuming there's not a senior user. Suggestive marks, also generally protectable. And these, these, these are really good marks because they are generally protectable, but they are suggestive of, of a quality of the products or services that you're selling. So my example here are Caterpillar tractors. And I like this one because Caterpillars kind of crawl along slowly and, and lots of little legs. And that kind of mimics how a track type tractor that Caterpillar sells might crawl along. And they don't have tiny little legs, but, but it kind of mimics the motion that a lot of their products uh, would have. So that makes that mark suggestive of a quality, or, uh, a quality of the product or service of the company. And then what's, what's funny is, is I have Kodak and Apple in the arbitrary or fanciful category, but these are not hard, fast categories. In fact, I think you could put also put them in the suggestive category. Apple, because I think Apple sometimes suggests to people the, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, the apple falling on the in his head and discovery of gravity. And that kind of leads toward, toward the thought of technology and innovation. And then computers, that's what Apple wants their computers to be thought of as innovative and, and technology. So that could be suggestive as well. Codex an interesting one too. I like this example because 
again, film, Kodak film, maybe it's a little bit dated, but I love the brand because the word Kodak, it's not really a word, but the, the I guess uh, in this example, we use it as a word, but it has sharp consonants, right? Kodak. And, 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 and so it's a sharp, definite sounding word. And that's suggestive of a quality of their film, what they want people to think their film is, is sharp images on film. So I like that in terms of the, the word itself suggests a quality or, or a quality of the, the goods that they sell. Uh, another one that's not on the list, but I like is like puffs, puffs uh, facial tissues, right? It, it sounds soft. It is soft, right? It has soft consonants and it's just a soft sounding word. And that's what you want out of your facial tissues. So anyways, uh, so that's arbitrary, fanciful, and suggestive. The, the next category, descriptive, generally not protective and uh, protectable unless you obtain secondary meaning. My example here is Holiday Inn. So in and of itself, if you don't think about the brand Holiday Inns, Holiday Inn is a string of words, is an inn to go to on your holiday, which is exactly what a lot of Holiday Inns are. So absent anything else, that's, else, that's not a protectable mark. Now, Holiday Inn has been in business for a very long time. I don't, I don't represent them, so I don't know a, a whole lot of detail about that company, but they've been in business for a lot of time and they've been out in commerce for a lot of time. And the public as a whole has been, has, has come to understand that Holiday Inn is a specific brand. So that's called secondary meaning that the public now understands that that means something more than just the generic uh, thought of Holiday Inn. So that is protectable and it is actually registered trademark, uh, uh, you know, at this point, but it wouldn't have been when they first started uh, selling the services. And the final category, not protectable really ever, is purely generic marks. And my example here is somebody could call their water H2O water, and that's not protectable. H2O is just another way of saying water. Anybody can call their water H2O. Agua would be another example, right? You, if you call your water you know, water in another language, agua water, that's not protectable either because it's changing the language or using a chemical formulation for the same thing that it is, whatever it is, is generic and, and not protectable. And then, and then at the, the last point here, and I've already brought this up before, but when you're picking this, you want to pick what you want, but you're still, the issue could be that you're confusingly similar to someone else with a senior mark or name in similar goods and services. So that's where searching potentially comes in or registration to make sure that you can protect the mark that you're that you're looking for. Spent a lot of time on trademarks. I'm gonna go a little faster through the rest of the trademark stuff. That's really the most important that I've covered already. So, you know, searching, there's some different options for searching. You can look through these later, but it ranges everything from just basic Google searching all the way up to there's, there's very sophisticated third parties that can do a full-fledged report on, on what's the viability of your selected, selected trademark. Uh, the confusingly similarity uh, standard that an examiner would apply, but you would want to apply as well if you're trying to evaluate your own brand, particularly before you talk to an attorney. These are some of the factors that you would think about. There, there's no real hard, fast rule. So you really just kind of got to think about whether the public would be confused. Somebody who doesn't know much about you or this other what other, other mark, would they be confused that they might be similar or the same mark or related to one another? We have one quick, yeah. one more quick question. Um, what are some of the tools or platforms that someone can use to determine if the ideas um, and naming conventions are available? It, it, um, one, I, so I think that question is in terms of availability of the trademark, although type whoever type in the in the response if if I'm off base with the question, but I think the question is what are the tools and they're kind of on this page right so you start with with Google searches Google brand searches are are. Are, are a good way uh, to start because everybody knows how to use that and it's, it's quite sophisticated and and you can you can find a fair bit of information that way the other thing is if you if you google google brand search uspto tess then you that'll take you to the uspto's trademark searching web page and then you can do some searches there now when you do the searching you don't just want to search your exact brand again you're evaluating confusingly similar and that's why these searches are not entirely straightforward you have to think about spelling variations or variations in spacing is are the words squished together or separated uh alternative spellings funny spellings a lot of brands take something that's 
a word that's descriptive and misspell it and file it as their brand and are sometimes successful with that but the thing is is that you may not find those misspelled brands if you're not searching for the misspelled brands so that's where uh you know some search tools has the ability have the ability to add wild cards in the in the search string and, and and kind of make those searches more complex but i would start with google and then maybe go to uspto So, so copyright, so second category. Um, and we're gonna go a little faster, but, but the thing is trademarks does take longer. So there's more to it. Copyright is, is pretty straightforward. So copyrights are ex original expressions of authorship fixed in, in some kind of tangible medium. The traditional examples are literature and music and art and these sorts of things. But in, a, you know, in the context of the business world, particularly a startup business world, I think computer software code is where this will likely come up for you. And maybe in terms of content on your, on your web page, publish content. Um, copyrights are protected upon creations. It's kind of similar to trademark in that in that once in trademarks, once you put it out there, it's it's protected under common law. Under copyrights, once you've created it, it has a level of protection. And whether or not you publish it or don't publish it, it still has protection under copyright law. Now there's some distinctions as to how that protection works in terms of publication versus non-publication and the right to publish. But the holder has the exclusive rights to that work. And and um, you know and, and to do the variety of things, make you sell, license, and so on and so forth. That copyrighted work. The you know the last point here is really to emphasize that that these kind of creative works are the things that are eligible for copyright protection. Your ideas and concepts, systems, discoveries that aren't really necessarily creative or are not considered creative works and are not copyrightable. They're not, they're not protectable under this, this category of intellectual property protection. Uh, go pretty, pretty fast, fair use. So the, you know, the news, for example, can comment on copyrighted works without running afoul of copyright law. So that's a fair use. And there's a, there's a few others, but you do wanna be careful to not lift lift copyrighted works and put them on your web page, you're likely to get a, um, a, you know, a cease and desist type letter in the mail, or at least possible you could do that. So you want to avoid that unless you're truly providing commentary or news reporting. Registration is important for enforcement. And that's really all I need to say about this slide. There's, there's more here, but if you, you think that you're, you're, you need to enforce a trademark, then you need, I'm sorry, a copyright, then you really need to look at registration. Before that, there's advantages in terms of accruing damages and some other things, but it's not ne necessary. And from a perspective of a startup, maybe not where you need to put uh, most of your time and, and energy. Uh, duration, you can listen to this and you, uh, you, you can read through this and you don't have to apply the copyright notice. It's no longer required, but it's a nice thing to do. It's easy. It's free. I mean, to the extent you can type the, the public, uh, the copyright notice in there, and it can scare off some folks that might be inclined to, to lift your works. Third category, trade secrets. This one is even easier. I've only got one slide on this one. So trade secrets protect uh, uh, commercially valuable anything that's secret and that you put in place uh, policies and procedures to keep it secret. So commercially, uh, commercially valuable and secret, and that's it. They're, they're, um, the, the key with that is really the policies and procedures to, to maintain the secrecy. So you need to have confidentiality agreements. You need to have, in, in terms of physical secrets, lock them up, put them behind a door, locked door, uh, uh, you know, need to know uh, act, or um, uh, limited access, uh, locked file cabinets. In a more you know modern age, that's that's password protected servers or particular uh, access to particular areas of your data storage. That's need to know, and those things are important in maintaining the secrecy. Because once a trade secret is no longer secret, if it gets out there, the, the trade secret's lost. So you need to have policies and procedures in place to keep it secret. And if you do that, and if a secret is stolen, then you do have a cause of action that you could pursue. You know, common examples is an employee taking a secret with them when they leave your company, um, and then taking it to their to their next employer. So you can you could go after that employee, and you can go after the next employer 
for uh, for a trade secret action. So this is important. And, it, and the thing about trade secrets which, um, that, that for startups is that it's really easy and it doesn't really require much, if any, real legal help other than you just need to make sure that you put in policies and procedures, maybe employment agreements in, to, in case of employees that define that you have secrets, trade secrets, and that you intend to protect them and that these individuals cannot take those things with them. That's trade secrets and so patents. So again, I'm uh, go, go a little faster here, but so, so patents are um, uh, our processes, uh, uh, manufacturers, compositions of material or, 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 or um, uh, chemical formulations that, uh, uh, that are inventive. And when you get a patent on one of those things, this is something that comes up a lot. It doesn't give you the right to do whatever, whatever that thing that you have a patent on. There may be other other patents at play. There may be other intellectual property rights at play. But what it does, it gives you the right to exclude others from from making, using, selling, so on and so forth. Your patented invention. The the question with patents that comes up, there's two really. The first one really is, can, can I can't could I get a patent? And that really comes down to patentability, and that's that's sections 102, 102, 101, 102, and 103. And I list them in the order, increasing order of difficulty. So utility just means that there, that there's some, uh, it's functional. It serves some function in the world. That it has utility, and this is almost always a, an easy checkbox. It only comes up in a, in, in my experience, it only really comes up in a university setting, where you know maybe a professor comes up with something that doesn't really know how to use it in the real world. And that's really rare. So utility is pretty easy to check off. Novelty means it's new. It's never been done before anywhere in the world at any point in history. And it sounds like a really high bar, but it's kind of a low bar because it doesn't take much of a change to make something new that's never been done before. My example is usually a dry erase marker, but here's a here's a pen. There's a pen. I'll, let's assume it's a black pen. What if I made a pen just like this, but made it uh, a shade of blue? Well, not blues a bad, maybe a shade of purple that no one's ever made, made a pen with quite that shade of purple before. That would satisfy the novelty standard because there's never been a pen just like this at that particular shade of purple. However, it's likely fails the non-obviousness test. So it, it, it's, it's an obvious variation, right? To make a slight change in color on a pen. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it, it, it's, it's, can be difficult to evaluate whether what you have is truly non-obvious or inventive. And that's where you really have to talk to an attorney about it and kind of bounce the idea off the attorney and perhaps do some searching to determine what else is out there and whether what you have is, is truly uh, uh, inventive. Or, uh, yeah, inventive. This slide, this is kind of a separate body of law that's been developed in the last 10 years directed to patent eligibility. And it really came up in the context of software patents, uh, at least in, in, in my practice area. And the takeaway from this, you can read through some of these things and you can do a, a search on uh, Alice decision and find tons of articles on this. But the bottom line is that, uh, you know, hardware and physical things are generally patent eligible out there in the world. Software is generally patent eligible as well, but you need to disclose. You need to dis, you have a high threshold of technical disclosure in a patent application to meet patent eligibility requirement for software. And then methods of doing business generally not generally not patentable. I think it's worth the conversation because there's exceptions to all these, but that's a really difficult hurdle to meet in terms of business methods. Yeah, do you need a patent and how and is it worth the cost is really what this is all about. Uh, no, I mean, if it's not worth the cost, then you go to market without and you compete in the marketplace just like just like you would uh, and you compete on better product, better price you know, on business considerations. The patent really is a question to value right and whether you whether whether the cost in the cost of filing and prosecuting the patent and the risk of failure is worth the additional value that it provides and you can do a few different things with patents you can play offense you can you know you could sue someone now that's 
unlikely with startups, but you can also play offense by just doing a licensing campaign and trying to, to correct, collect fees that way. You can also use it defensively and, and see if, uh, you know, mark your products and services as patented and that can dissuade some, some competitors. And then in terms of fundraising and exit strategies, it can build value in your company. So there's things to do. I'm not gonna go through all these details, but there's different types of patents uh, and, and different options in terms of filing domestically and internationally. And I'd be happy to talk with anybody about those things uh, offline if, if necessary. Uh, you know, here's the things that I want you to remember. Confidentiality is key. So this goes back to the first question or, or one of the first questions, whereas when do you need to talk to an attorney? So you wanna to talk to, to an attorney before you go public because confidentiality buys you time under the patent law, but once you're public or out there in commerce, you're losing rights. And within a year, pretty much all the rights are gone. So you wanna have that conversation early to at least determine whether it's worth exploring further or not. Um, I'm not going to go through much of this other IP because I'm running out of time, but I do want to talk briefly about ownership. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but I want to circle back to it because it's so important. Because it doesn't matter which of these categories of intellectual property you choose or how you file it or so on and so forth, if you don't own the underlying intellectual creation. Cre intellectual creation ownership starts with the creator or the inventor or whomever, the, the mind that created. So you need employment agreements for employees that, that automatically move title to your company. If you're hiring contractors to do work for you that are creating for you, you need agreements with those folks that, that say that anything they create is owned by you. And that's something that you can just read those agreements. And, and as a start, I always recommend you have an attorney look at those things, but you can look for these provisions in their standard agreements and see if they're there or if they're not, uh, object. You should object because you don't own those things. Uh, absent those agreements, you don't own those things. There's a bunch of other types of agreements. Confidentiality agreements are an important one because they buy you time on the patent end. You can keep things confidential making very limited disclosures to parties that are under a comp obligation of confidentiality. And then there's some other other mm, other agreements that you need to be considering uh, and, and talk to an attorney about here as well. And that's just a list of, of, of assets that you could think about protecting under one or more of these categories. And that's really all I have. Uh, so I, I think we got a little bit of time for questions. I went over just slightly, but uh, I didn't go all the way over. So if you have more questions, uh, you know, please throw them at Kimberly and, and thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear your questions. I know that there are always so many questions that surround this. Um, you know, one of the questions that I had while you were talking, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, read anyone else's, so please send them in. So we talked about a trademark. Um, if you go through and get a trademark, how much does that cost? Is it thousands? Is it tens of thousands? What what does that look like? Yeah, the co the cost question. I mean, it comes up all the time. Um, so so in terms of trademarks, your 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 cost. Well, so one, you have rights under common law, re, you know, automatically, right? So that costs you essentially zero. But like I said, at some point you want to do some searching, you want to do some registration before you put some sufficient effort into your marketing that you're not willing to rebrand. So once you're at that point in your startup, yeah, you're looking at, you know, searches is maybe a thousand dollar type endeavor, maybe $1,500 endeavor to work with an attorney to do an appropriate search. And then to do the filing that maybe is another $1,500, $2,000 endeavor to prepare and file your application. And it may go through easily, although, or you may get some pushback from the examiner that, the, that, the, that you then have to deal with. But that's kind of the range of dollars. And without knowing more, I can't, I can't really speak to it any, any more specific. Uh, let, let me, although it's a great question, so let me just cover it on the other categories, right? So that's trademarks. Copyrights are really easy. And in fact, fairly do-it-yourself friendly. Um, and there, there's, there's guides and things on the, the uh, US Copyright, Copyright Office website that'll help you go through this. But I think the registration fee is, I don't know, it's $50 or $100. It's a relatively nominal cost in terms of what, in terms of the you know, legal fee realm. 
So copyrights is, is pretty, uh, pretty cost effective. Trade secrets is really cost effective as well and it essentially could be zero other than you may want to talk to an attorney about a strategy for putting your policies and procedures in place, employment agreements, those sorts of things. So that could be zero or maybe 500, 1,000, 1,500 for, for an employment agreement. Patents is the one that's always, it's just expensive and there's no real way around that. And you know, you know the, the numbers I throw out, and these are laws of averages, median type things here, but to get to move a patent all the way through filing to issuance, and this is that's like a twenty to thirty thousand dollar endeavor spread out over two to five years. And we always try to push the cost as much forward as we can so that you know the viability of the business and the profitability to justify further expense. But that's the magnitude of numbers that you're looking at. To just get started in a in the patent world, there's there's searches which can be, again, similar to trademark, $1,000, $1,500 to, to have a pretty good search done to determine whether it makes sense to move forward. And then there's, it's in the slide deck, I kind of glossed over due to time, but there's something called a provisional patent application. And that's a placeholder patent application that's cheap is all relative, but it's a cheap way into getting a pending patent application. And that's typically a three to $4,000 endeavor. So it's still not cheap, but it's cheap in the grand scheme of patent. Great. I have two questions from the audience. The first one is, how long could a patent process take? <laughs> well, it's a great question, but that's, that's kind of what I just said, right? So let me just walk through the timeline uh, a, a little bit just to give you a sense. So I would say, again, laws of averages is kind of a three to five year uh, deal. But let's say, let's take a typical scenario for a startup, which you start with the informal placeholder provisional. So that, that prepare and file that. So that starts the time timeline, right? A year later, you have to convert it into a regular, formal, full application if you want to keep keep moving forward. So that's one year. It's going to sit waiting for examination six months to eighteen months ish. So now you're what are you? You're you're now maybe two and a half years out, right? You're going to go through examination. So examiner is going to reject it almost always, and, and all that really is the beginning of a negotiation of scope of your patent with the examiner. And that's another six months, a year, maybe longer, but now we're right around four years, right? And then if you get to allowance and the examiner says, okay, I'll allow your patent application, you owe one more fee. Uh, and so there's a few more months associated with that. So, I mean, you're four years and change at that point, if everything kind of goes typically. And then the other thing to note about time frame is, so patents are good for roughly 20 years, and you owe three maintenance fees throughout that period of time. So three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years, you owe three different fees. Otherwise your, your patent expires. So at each of those points, you think about whether it's worth the additional expense to pay the maintenance, or maybe your product or service or company has moved on in a different direction and it's not worth paying that fee. Great. Okay, so should we have to file trademarks in other countries as well? And if so, which ones are optimal? Yeah, that's a tough one, uh, even for bigger bigger business. So I, I'd say with startups, probably just focus on your, your home market because it gets exorbitantly expensive really fast once you take everything I said and apply, because all of these rights, everything, this whole presentation is really US national focused. But fortunately, most countries ha are participants to various treaties under these different areas of law. And there's copyright law, trademark law, patent law that's similar pretty much everywhere around the world. The problem is it's exorbitantly expensive, particularly on the patent end, but even on the trademark end to pursue protection in every single little country around the world. So the strategies are one focus on your home market first and your main markets second. And that may be down the list quite a bit second. The, but it is important. So here's what happens, and this has happened to my clients, and it's a, it's it's really difficult to get around. But you you have you have a you know successful small business in the U.S. You have good trademark protection in the U.S. You're having your product manufactured. We we always always seem to pick on China, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll pick on China here as well. So you're having it manufactured in China and shipped over here. Well, some Chinese entrepreneurs like, hey, this is a great product that's selling really well in the U.S. They turn around and start making a competing product in their home market and they file an identical trademark in their home market and they're selling 
their version of your product under your brand in their market. And there is not a whole lot you can do about that because you didn't file before them in that market and you didn't have a product or service in that mark that pre in that market that predates their their trademark filing so you can get burned by not filing in foreign markets and in in those scenarios the scenario i just described the best that there are some actions you can pursue in the courts and and some of the big companies have won on those but they're difficult and time expensive a time consuming and expensive normally the way out of those is you negotiate you negotiate out and you pay them off and, and and obtain the mark that they filed on your behalf in their home market so it's it's a tough one and the timing is really when you you, you know when are you going to go to market in those bigger in, in those other markets and how risky do you think it is that someone else is going to swoop in and, and and take your trademark and file in those other places Okay, one last quick, quick, quick question. Um, is there a rule of thumb for how much I should plan on spending to ensure supports moving forward tied to an anticipated ROI? Can you repeat it one more time? I know, I'm, I'm just not thinking sure. about it. Is there a rule of thumb for how much I should plan on spending to ensure supports moving forward tied to an anticipated ROI? I guess, is there a threshold of what is your, should your return be before you go through the cost yeah, to do this? Yeah, goodness. I, so I, under, I think I understand the question. It's really, I'll put it in my own words, but I think the question is really, when you're looking at ROI and other measurements of profitability of your business, is there a threshold or something that you look at in terms of ROI or another metric to determine whether it's worth patenting or worth protecting or not so much? And I'm not aware, the simple answer is I'm not aware of such a rule, but I do think that's the right question. Um, you've got to look at your projected profitability because if you're looking at profitability, if you're really niche, you're really small and you just don't think it's ever going to get really big, maybe it's just a passion project, and you know maybe your revenue your your revenues are in the six figure ranges and your and your growth and your profits are maybe five five figure ranges if you're successful you're unlikely to get a lot of competition on that and and, and spending thirty thousand dollars on a patent is not likely a good spend on a similar amount of profitability. Now, I don't know over what period of time, right? Those are all really business questions. And most attorneys like myself will defer and say, well, it's really a business question. I can just give you costs, timeframes, and potential value. And then you've got to look at that compared with profitability to figure out whether it's worthwhile or not. Eric, thank you so much. This was a fascinating topic. We learned so much. We appreciate it. Join us next for leveraging local growth to expand an, um, at a national level. I wanted to have a huge thank you to our sponsors, our platinum sponsors, ARC Thrift Stores, Avaset Communications, Ward Electric Company, and the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, our Gold Biz West Left Hand Brewery Docketly, uh, our um, connected sponsors, Downtown Longmont and High Plains Bank, and our in-kind Handprint Inc., Circle Graphics, Sticker Giant, and Chop 5. Remember, we do have great in-person events tonight from 4 to 6. Join us at a networking happy hour, happy hour at Abbott and Wallace Distilling and a network happy hour at Cycle Hops. So enjoy. We hope to see you back here at one o'clock. Individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, like my son Kennedy, have one of the highest unemployment rates in our state. Please make employment of people with disabilities a priority. Crashing waves tie in your stomach in the night. Creaking ship. Moonless sky and you're lost You are brave And friends with the dark But tonight You're lonely 
far from home Tonight you're broken Crashing waves tying your stomach in the knots Creaking ship Moonless sky and you're lost You are brave And friends with the dark But tonight you're lonely and far from home Tonight you're broken but free to roam Let go and hear the water flow Let
When the car came, you fell on the floor. Doctor said, six months. Hey, welcome to the Longmont Startup Week. My name is Kimberly McKee and I'm the Executive Director of the Longmont Downtown Development Authority. And we are thrilled to be here with you today. I am excited, really excited to be here right now. Uh, we have a panel that I've had the uh, luxury to speak with and the talent and the um, just the ideas that are in this room are, are fascinating. So it's gonna be a really excited, exciting time to learn. Uh, today's uh, topic right now is called leveraging local growth to expand to a national level. I know that in every job that you have, you probably are working with some kind of marketing or promotion or talking about your product. And I think we are all going to learn so much today. Uh, with us today, we have Lori Jones from Avaset Communication, Jennifer Bridge and Nikki Kent. Yes. No, sorry, um, from Branded Beat. And I'm going to turn it over to each of them to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about themselves, and then we will uh, start this panel discussion. So, Lori, we'll start with you. Great. Thank you. Um, again, Lori Jones from Avocet Integrated Marketing. And we are lucky to have been in Longmont uh, for 41 years. Uh, we're celebrating 41 years this fall. And um, you know, we, we have an incredible team of integrators. We integrate um, owned assets with uh, PR and shared and um, paid assets to, to develop a fully integrated communications program. And one of the topics we're gonna be talking about today are those shared assets, something so integral um, to a fully integrated campaign to really amplify a brand's um, position in the marketplace. And, uh, so we have been here uh, in its infancy. We were a very early adopter when it came to social media. Uh, a lot of selling to convince clients that social media would be a key element of their program. And again, we're happy to share some of those insights today. Awesome, thank you. I am Jen Bridge of Branded Beat. I'm a photographer by trade and was doing a lot of work with businesses uh, with brand visualization for um, their companies and noticed that there was a real lack of understanding of how to put those visuals out into the world. And luckily I met my business partner, Nikki, and we um, were able to help a lot of small business owners see their own potential through their visuals by getting them out onto social media. So we kind of came up with this idea to pair the two. And so we uh, offer social media management to small businesses in the Longmont area primarily. Um, and then also take care of all of their content creation, their brand visuals, um, things like that. So, and I am a Longmont native, so I'm from here, married to my high school sweetheart. <laughs> so, so I'm excited to be on the local television channel. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm Nikki Nez. Uh, like Jen said, I'm her business partner. We co-founded Branded Beat. We're a baby business still. We're um, going into our second year uh, of being a Longmont business. Um, but And we are primarily focused on those shared assets, so specifically social media. Um, and I, um, I do graphic design and social media uh, marketing specifically. That's what I, I was doing before I met Jen. And like she said, we paired up and we're just an amazing team together. <laughs> That's great. Well, I am super excited to dig into this topic with all of you. And, you know, we're talking about local. Define localization uh, as it relates to social media. So how would you look at that? Sure. Uh, so really, social media is not local uh, from the standpoint of, you know, anyone um, in any state, in any town, in any country, for the most part, can ultimately, you know, take a look at, at your brand. But what we mean by this is really how you localize the audience um, and that you're that you're focused on at any given moment in time and how you create a loyal following and engagement and, and so on and so forth. So even if you happen to be, um, you know, a local retailer in Longmont, um, you can still pull from other towns. How you will localize that um, and ultimately create pull is one um, one way of localization, right? Another way of localization, you might be a national brand um, at a trade show. How are you going to localize your message, you know, within the confines of one square mile on the show floor during that time is another way um, to take a look at it. So 
um, how you amplify that um, and how you um, develop strategies to amplify it based on the goal, given the situation at hand, is really what we're talking about. And we really find that, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, that local is really what you make it. So maybe local to you is the community that you've built around your brand and your brand evangelists that show up for you um, and share your content on social media, help you push your business further um, by just showing up and being in that space. So your community could live in geographically different places, but it feels local. And if you empower those local people and you really get, um, get them on board with what you're doing and sharing and, and you know, it, it really can grow your brand to that more national level. Yeah, I would add to it that <clears throat> uh, it is also geolocality and it's a, that's also yeah. totally okay. Uh, as Lori touched on, if it's if you are a, lo a local Longmont business and you want to specifically market to local Longmont people um, or other local Longmont businesses, then you can really lean into that. Um, and social media has a lot of tools to allow that um, with the um, location sharing and um, geotagging on where your content's existing and, or where you want your content to be reaching. Um, you know, social media is really built as a tool to allow you to, to leverage that. Great. So social media, right? A lot of people um, either think of it as an afterthought or it's a necessary evil or it's this animal that they just, you know, can't, the starts and stops would be too hard. What, in your point of view, is the importance of social media and what it can have on a brand impacts? I, we always say that social media is to be social. So it's meant to be social. We really believe in showing up authentically for your, like, and not to misuse or overuse that kind of buzzword. Right now, a lot of people say authenticity, but sometimes it's kind of used improperly, <laughs> but we really believe in um, using social media to be social, to connect with people who really want to learn more about your business. They want to learn more about why they should buy from you, why they should support you. And um, it, we talk about it being a storefront. I don't, do you want to yeah. elaborate on it? Being... Um, one of my favorite analogies, I'm a really bad, I like I use overuse analogies, um, but I do love them and I'll use them right now. I think of um, how you show up on social media as sort of being your virtual storefront and you know where does anybody want to be any any local business would love to have a storefront location on main street in the town square to have that high visibility and social media affords you that um, it, it is where the audience exists they are there they are primed and ready for your content and it's just a matter of you opening your doors and saying hey here's where i am come and see what I have to show you. Um, and it's more than just creating an account and existing there. Um, you have to show up every day and kind of share what's happening um, in the day-to-day -day in your business. Yeah, go ahead. I would add, you know, regarding the importance of it. Um, so again, we're an integrated a, a firm and one component of what we deploy is social media. Um, but for every brand out there, an individual, a prospect, needs to interact with your brand 26 times before making a buying decision. That's a massive number. One of the co most cost-effective ways um, to amplify your brand and what you might be selling or promoting is social media. And um, to do that, you need that consistency, as you've touched upon. It needs to be brand compliant. It needs to be on tone. Um, it needs to be uh, wicked smart and creative. Um, there's a lot of continuity involved, which we'll get into later on. But even if you are a B2B brand or a B2C brand or a retail brand, it does not matter um, what you are marketing. Social media should be a very, very important piece of that fully integrated um, approach. And for a lot of brands, it's the only, the only thing that they can afford is social media. Um, so if you are new to market, the the most cost effective approach for you out of the shoot um, is social media um, and amplifying your voice there. And I think that that's the sorry, Jen, that's the primary client that we serve mm -hmm. are um, 
early businesses, young businesses who really don't have a gigantic budget to push into some of those other media um, opportunities that Lori was describing. Um, and it really, you, it, social media, you certainly can pay to play uh, and expand your reach um, monetarily, um, but there are so many ways to utilize it and do it free. And to add to that, that like social media is the piece of the toolkit of your marketing toolbox that is the most, it can be the most relatable and the most human place for you to show up as yourself, like who you really are, um, if you're a personal brand or, and there's personality behind each big brand as well. So it's the place where you get to kind of loosen up a bit and not be as controlled in your storytelling because people really want to know the, the, the humanity behind a business, especially these days, the, yeah. the trust in businesses um, from the consumer standpoint is, is, is research is showing it's like at an all time low. And so I feel like it's the place where you can really show up and be connecting with people. And like Nikki uses this analogy all the time of like when you're when you're at a party, you want to just show up to a party and shout into the room like I'm here and blah, 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 you know, something about look at my outfit and then leave you would stay and you would mingle and you would talk and you would grab a drink and you would socialize. And that's the benefit and the beauty of social media for a business is being able to show up a little bit more as yourself. I, it's a great tool to, um, you know, we talk a, a lot about uh, social selling, right? And um, there's a fine line between selling too much, especially with social media and really just letting people get to the point where they're making some of their own decisions. And that is where the content strategy um, and really the voice and what it is that we're talking about. You don't wanna insult people's intelligence and they know why they're going to the page or they know why in, you know, from an advertising standpoint, why that might be in front of them and to be very, very authentic um, and create that trustworthy trustworthiness um, is, is an area that I see a lot of brands uh, fail at because they look at it only to sell. And, and you've, again, 26 times, it's a big number, um, but move the client through the sales journey on their own when it's social media. You know, I think those are all fantastic points. And when you talk about the 26, you know, when you're starting a new event, right? You, there's so many events out there and you kind of see it. Mm -hmm. And then someone else shows something about it. And then, you have to see it that many times and then you go, maybe I need to be there because it seems like everyone else is going to be there and I don't want to be the odd man out. So I see that how that 26 can go through um, and the authenticity, you know, we work a lot with local downtown businesses as well as you all do. And it's telling their stories that they are the true people behind it. Even as you move to a national brand, it started somewhere and it started usually with a very fascinating story. And I think the personification can happen so much better on social media and little pieces and parts that you really start getting to know the businesses and you feel more connected. Mm -hmm. You do. And, and as a part of our strategic development process, um, when it when we move into um, the communications plan uh, with social media, we always start with strategic storytelling as the impetus behind anything that we're going to be doing. And what is the strategy? Um, what is the goal? Um, what is the message and how are we going to amplify that? And what do we want um, the people interacting with us with social media to do, right? And that's where a lot of that, um, that happens. That bottom up funnel uh, referral, you've got to go to this or you see someone as you've stated that says, I am going to it maybe in a calendar invite within Facebook, that to me is intriguing. And um, you know, the, the social media outlets themselves do a very beautiful job of amplifying that a lot for us based on um, what the people who, you know, the people who follow us or like us or interact with us. And then of course we're at interacting with do on social media daily. Great. And that's that piece of, you know, whether you love it or hate it, the algorithm can work in your favor. If you're, <laughs> if you're showing up regularly, uh, you're rewarded for, for that. And uh, that natural engagement happens much easier than when you're um, only showing up you know, every other week or something like that. Well, speaking of showing up, on average, we know that people spend over two hours per day on their social media. Um, so that's about 120 minutes. Um, and that is our opportunity to reach our ideal audience. What are some of the benefits that you see to that? You know, I, um, we have a real diverse client base and, um, 
we love it um, because it just keeps us sharp and we're constantly doing something new. Um, but one of our clients, um, Arc Thrift Stores, um, who has a local footprint here, um, we started with them um, with 17 stores and they now have 31 and 30 um, donation uh, drop-off locations. So getting to the point of having the conversation um, with their very astute marketing director that social media was gonna be an important thing early on um, was key. And we knew that we wanted to tiptoe our feet into it. So um, with ARC, what we did is we, we ended up choosing a channel, owning it, and then moving on to the next channel, always studying who our target market was and what the engagement was with that target um, market, and then um, ag again expanding. Now we just didn't span, expand linear from um, platform to platform. We also expanded within each platform. So um, you know, there's so many analytics at your disposal when it comes to social media, and we determined. Um, that based on the engagement, um, precisely what type of post was most effective. And we ended up knowing that we needed to post three times a day um, because the audience had grown to be so massive and large um, that we had to post three times a day in order to keep them engaged or get people, you know, when they were entering at lunch on a lunch break um, and then mm -hmm. exiting, you know, so. So our engagement, as we increased the amount of content, um, our engagement actually increased as well, um, which is really where we want. I mean, that's how we get to 26 times, right? Yeah. Um, because we see a lot of repeat engagement um, and shareability, tons of shareability um, with that brand in particular. I think it's a little tougher um, and it's why you've got to look at each client so differently. Um, in our situation, a lot of our B2B tech clients, totally different strategy, right? Uh, we might begin them on LinkedIn and, and utilize Facebook um, as an evening um, afterthought for them and post in the evening when they might be going um, to Facebook for the first time um, during their day. So based on what you are selling and what your service or product is, you really need to look at it very, very differently. Yeah, and I think you know what you're talking about with the time of day is so interesting and, and something that I think a lot of people overlook, um, that I'll just post when I have a moment to do it, but really to think about it more strategically than that, that you know, as she's describing, some of those tech clients may be only doing the leisurely social activities in the later evening. Um, you know. I used to work with a brand who really wanted to um, access uh, young mothers, mothers of infants. And we had a lot of success in pushing content out in the middle of the night um, because that's when they were up feeding babies. And, you know, as a relatively young mother myself, I certainly was scrolling Facebook um, and Instagram at two in the morning while I was nursing. And um, that's. I didn't have it when I was. Nursing. Yeah. <laughs> it was not a thing. <laughs> Um, but that's when you you have their access to that attention, and I think that um, that might not be something that um, many brands are thinking about. And I think it's really smart to consider um, that not only um, that the, these people are showing up two hours a day, but when are they showing up two hours a day, um, and really hitting them at those specific times. I, I wanted to add to that that uh, during COVID, it was, I mean, if you were seizing the opportunity to be on social during COVID, you were like really thinking ahead because uh, I think it was probably more than 120 minutes a day that people were spending um, on social media. Well, right now in the summertime and post COVID, you know, engagement across the board is seemingly down for a lot of people because people are going out to dinner now, they're going out more, they're spending more time with their families doing things again traveling and so we're you know we're seeing a lower amount of engagement across the board so if you're if you're in that position of like struggling and wondering where where's my audience where are they they might just be at the pool today like you know so so summertime is a is also a hard time to to um assess your engagement and it's a good time to think about like maybe slowing down and making a, a stronger strategy for like the fall when maybe engagement will the audience will be back on on their phones again so something to think about and I, as Lori touched on earlier um all of these platforms 
feature or feature rich with analytics and they give you all of the information that you need about when those when these people are plugged in and when they are most interested and so you really can play with it all of the time um, to try to hit those marks great we do have a question from our audience um what are reasonable social budgets to expect to spend for a young brand for local engagement strategies so <laughs> We, so I, I would say um, it depends on if you're hiring someone to help you or if you're going to be doing it on your own. And for some of the smaller brands out there, um, you know, to just have a strategy down on paper and start doing it on your own, I think is a, a fine approach. Um, so really that's your time, right? And it's a great investment in the future. Um, for our clients, and we're working, you know, with multinational clients that are, you know, they're very, very, very large clients. Um, so their budgets, you know, are thousands of dollars each month um, when it comes to social media with us. Um, but again, if you're a local smaller brand um, and you're looking to outsource, you know, I, I think, you know, the ladies to my, um, to your left, my right, <laughs> um, you know, can do incredible work um, to really launch you and, and, um, get you going. I'm not going to answer the price question for you. <laughs> I'll let you do that one. Well, and um, I think that it's but, I, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt yeah. you, Lori, but I think it's, it's an interesting question because there's a lot of facets to it because it's not, you might be outsourcing the work and there's certainly a fees associated with employing somebody to create this content for you. Um, but you could also be creating this content for yourself or employing somebody to do it and then paying additional money to expand that strategy. So, and, and I do have to say social media never goes well when you do it yourself. I mean, it's a fine way to start when you have no choice, right? Um, but it doesn't get executed on time and timing oh, is huge. Yeah. Um, there's typically not continuity with it. Um, so brand continuity is incredibly important. Um, typically, typically it's an afterthought. Um, it's not strategic. And there are professionals who do this, and it, there's a reason why it's a growing category and a minimum of two hours a day, you know, people spending with social media because it is working. Um, it's just a matter of how you fit into that. Um, so hire the professionals. I did want to mention that for ad spending specifically, we really like to focus on organic engagement and growing your your real following. Um, and so we don't we don't do a lot of paid stuff with our with our management clients unless they come to us with you know wanting to spend those ad dollars um pushing their content further because we see their brand a lot of success around just building that community that local community around their business yeah i think slow and steady wins the race in some cases um if it if you do put a lot of paid ads you know behind your content that's going out you can see a lot of rapid growth um, but you might not actually be picking up clients that are going to convert and really that's what all of this is about we can talk about engagement all day long and getting the likes and the follows and shares but if they're not purchasing your goods or your services um then they're not worth your time right and and i think it depends you know again uh, if you have paid as a part of your strategy um then you want to be in social media as a part of that but building it organically is an absolute must because the ads will not work unless you have an organic following. Um, but once you know that you've got budgets, um, social media is one of the most rapidly growing digital um, advertising uh, tools out there and it has been for years and years and years. I think for those starting out or even those who've been doing it for a while, knowing where to show up and how to show up is overwhelming. There's so many different platforms. So how do I know, or how does anyone know which one is best for their business, which they should focus on? Do you do all, do you do some? How do you make those choices? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think that people should be showing up where their ideal audience is. As Lori mentioned earlier with LinkedIn, the tech, the those tech companies, those B2B businesses, um, it's certainly spending a lot of time on LinkedIn is a, is a solid starting strategy. Um, but I think something that um, we like to remember a lot is that those people are, are also on Facebook and as a leisurely uh, way to engage in social media um, or on Instagram. 
and um, activating your presence in those places, either initially or later on, you know, starting, starting where your audience is and then building to those other locations um, is key. But you don't always have to, as a, as a B2B business, you don't always have to focus specifically on accessing those businesses. Um, you can also access people who are working for those businesses and really build a lot of brand awareness. And we've seen a lot of success with that with one of our clients. Um, we put a lot of content out on Instagram for them, and we are talking really primarily to the end user of a product that our company is sell selling to businesses directly. Um, and we're building a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about what that product is. Um, and that isn't through LinkedIn. It's kind of we're sending it the other way. We've reversed the funnel, so to speak. Um, and I think that um, thinking outside of the box is also really important when it comes to figuring out where to show up and who to who to target. And it builds that brand evangelist around around it when you know the end user is the one who's talking about about the, this great product that they just have to have, and then they go to their the buying power within their business and say, I want that. I have to, have, you know, to, to do my job better, I need that. Um, and that could be technology, that could be a tool, that could be a, lot, a number of things. And so um, it, it is important to kind of think through who, who all is using the, pro, the product and where are they hanging out. We also like to say that you should really get good at one of them. So focus on one. Um, Instagram and Facebook are easily coupled. You can push your content from Instagram over to Facebook and you can kind of build those at the same time. But if you think that your content is best seen on YouTube, get a really solid YouTube channel strategy going, you know, and focus on that or um, LinkedIn if that's if that's where you're going to hang out. But don't try to do all of them at once. That's just overwhelming. You're going to fall down on all of them instead of um, succeeding at any of them. So that's what we kind of like to encourage people to do. I agree. And, and, and this is the reason why. Um, the audience is going to change a little bit by each um, avenue or each tool that you're using, number one. Number two, if you're trying to build a new audience, adding a new channel at that stage is a, gr is a great way to, to build it. We have um, some missionary work um, that we're in, not true missionary work, that's an, a marketing term, <laughs> some missionary work that we're investing in right now to build an audience for one of our um, clients. We know they're not going to be buying anytime soon, but we want them to be considering us in about five years. So we have interjected TikTok um, into their strategy. Um, to bring them along and create brand awareness mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that evangelism that you're talking about um, to really get them to move. We cannot use the content that we're deploying in Facebook or Instagram in TikTok. It's yeah. just, you can't do it. It's, it's totally different. The other thing I will add um, is what we're talking about is human to human marketing, right? We, you know, yes, we say B2B and B2C and in retail and all of that, but it's why um, on LinkedIn, even though that may be a day strategy, it's why we deploy an evening strategy for our B2B brands on Facebook. It's human to human marketing. And um, if we can, again, 26 times is a massive number, right? If we can interact with them or even they see our logo um, and engage, um, they've got, you know, that it immediate the psychology there is imprinted in them, um, in their mind, um, then we've done a major, we, we've won, right? And that's how that all adds up. Great, wonderful. So types of content uh, become a real creative way to amplify your message. What are some of the unique ways that you have seen brands be able to take care of different or take advantage, I'm sorry, of different types of content? Well, I think you should continue to expand on what you were just saying with um, TikTok and Facebook and you know mm -hmm. the different types, types of content that live on those platforms. Um, because you could, while you can certainly share video to Facebook or Instagram where, where it's gaining a lot of traction, you know, TikTok or YouTube is where that type of content thrives. So if you're a person who loves to be on video or show, showcasing your, you know, goods or services, then certainly video content's the right strategy for that. Um, and those platforms are brilliant for that. 
Um, but I, I think that you ought to expand on that. You know, and it, it also depends. So I'm just going to give you an example um, of Avocet's podcast, Integrate and Ignite. Um, so it's a thought leadership strategy. And I'm um, the host of the show. Uh, we push out a show a week, um, about 40 minutes, where I'm interv interviewing a, a marketing expert on a topic. And the beauty of this sort of an approach is if you, if you look at a single strategy as the hub of your wheel, if you will, and then you can slice and dice it many different ways and push it out on Facebook, you know, Twitter, um, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, so on and so forth. You can write blogs on it. You can write eBooks on it. Um, you know, you've got these guesting strategies on behalf of the show as well on a single piece of content. Then you have, you know, in our situation, about 15 different ways in which we interact with our audience with a single episode. And we, we started out with audio um, just because it was the easiest thing to do. And I like to wear my hair up in ponytails and I don't always like to wear a business suit every day. Um, so no, but you don't wanna make that decision based on that um, <laughs> at all. Um, but you know, it was a great way for us to, to amplify it. And, and we started out um, you know, slow and now you know, the show has, you know, anywhere between three and 5,000 downloads a month. And so, you know, these uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are now listening to the show, downloading it. They make an appointment each week. We release the show on the same day, same time, every, every uh, week back to timing. Yeah, timing. they begin to make that appointment for it. And that's how, that's how you show up. You could have video at the hub of your spoke. You could have white papers. You could have um, blogs. You could have all sorts of things, but just make it consistent. Make sure it's brand compliant um, and make sure um, that you are pushing out content um, that is interesting for the audience. Oh, sorry, I was going to say one thing. Um, as Lori mentioned earlier, that 26 times that they need to consume something from you in order to have it sink in. Yeah utilizing this concept where you take a piece of long form content and then break it into smaller more digestible pieces hits them over and over and over again with that same messaging so maybe it's about that event and it's you know let's talk about it um in, in a podcast and then let's create some type of commercial about it and let's create a blog post about who's going to be there you know all of these little pieces build up to that 26 times and then that's that's where you're going to start to see a conversion and I mean, really, it's sort of common sense because it's working smarter, yeah, not sure. harder. You, you create one piece of content and then that grows into, what you say, like 16, 15, 16 pieces yeah. for yourself, yeah. And speaking to the small business owner who's just starting out um, and you know not producing a podcast yet or things like that, that they might start with an email list and you, you write one really high quality email a month and you start building your list and you take the, like from the long form, you cut it into short form things, quotes, uh, pieces of tips and tricks, information that you can put out on social media. And don't be afraid to say the same thing over and over and over on social media because people are at, using it at different times of day. They're not all seeing the same content at the same time. And so there's no way, no reason why you can't just take the same thing and use it, you know, until you've beat it dead <laughs> and then people start to really get that stamp in their brain of like this is what this person does this is what this company talks about this is what they you know how, how what how i can um use their product or their service and uh, yeah so don't be afraid of reusing stuff over and over yeah you know i i think that's a great point and i think um especially someone who tries to go it alone which i think is hard um you get tired of your own brand a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you start to tweak it or you start to do something which gets so confusing to the people that don't live and breathe it. And I think um, in my whole career, people have always cited, have you ever seen a Nike swoosh? Uh -huh. <laughs> You've probably seen it for 30, 40 years. Um, so staying on brand is, is such an important um, to this cohesive approach, even if your message might look um, your message, you're, you're delivering it a little differently maybe on Twitter than you are on Facebook or on Instagram. So talk a little bit about the advice you have for the audience regarding staying on brand and, um, and really making that work. 
Uh, visuals are huge. People see things and know, like to your point about the Nike swoosh, if you saw that anywhere, wherever you are in the world, you would automatically know what that is. And, and that's why good, that's good branding. You know, when you, when you know uh, a brand, when you're scrolling through your feed, and think about this just for a second, when you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and you're looking and looking, looking, you come across something and you, and before you even see that person's handle at the top, you know whose it is because it always looks like that. It always shows those colors or, or that background or, or that face or that product or whatever it may be, they're showing up so consistently that you recognize their brand without even having to see their name. And so being on brand with your visuals is huge. And that's why branding photography can be such a powerful tool. And if you're just starting out, might be one of the best things you invest in is a good branding system because you have to have visuals that match your brand, that they're high quality, people can relate to them, and they make sense day in and day out for, for what you're putting out there. Yeah, and make it easier on yourself. Like, you know, you've built this company, you've ha you have a logo for it, you've, you've paid probably money for that, use it and make sure that you're leaning into it as much as possible because the more that you show up consistently, the more that when they see those 15 pieces of content that all support the same messaging, they know instantly who it's coming from. And I think the Nike Swish is like such a great example of that because you see it on shoes, on shorts, on balls, on whatever, and you know exactly where it's coming from. Even though the content is different, even though what you're seeing is different, you know exactly who it's coming from because they have been so true to the consistency of showing up as their own brand. And they, they could have taken it too far though, right? They could have always said, okay, our Swish is only going to be blue. And when the swish is only blue, what happens is this, people don't see it anymore. So brands need to add excitement to that consistency. So seasonality is a great way to do that, right? Uh, so, um, you know, you'll see Nike staying again with that example, who will colorize or add Christmas bells to the swish um, throughout the holiday season, or they might utilize, um, you know, something that's more, um, uh, opaque um, during the summer um, because of the bright skies and water sports, or or they could do that regionally as well. And so making sure um, that you do add life and that you don't take continuity too far while maintaining the branding, um, I think is a real gift because that's when you wake up the audience. They need to be woken up, especially with brands um, that are really well known. They need excitement added to them. Think about Coca-Cola and and the polar bear campaign, right? Yeah. Um, that is a great way where Coca-Cola woke up the audience. And so deploying those sort of strategies, um, it could be look and feel, it could be um, you know, a brand character, it could be seasonality, it can be a number of different things that psychologically we need to make sure um, that we keep our, our audience in tune with, um, I think is where, I, where a lot of marketers get stale and they just don't, um, they don't do the best thing for the brand that they could be doing. I, I was going to add to that, sorry Jen, I keep interrupting you. Um, that um to, but also to be very mindful about it being performative mm -hmm. because if you're is that what you're gonna say see we're the same um <laughs> because if you you know are somebody if you are a brand that has absolutely nothing to do with you know the holiday season yeah. if there's no reason for you to be talking about it then don't rebrand yourself or or pepper that in where it seems unnecessary because you lose that authenticity that you've been building um, and I think that there's a lot of missteps, especially around some like more hot topic mm -hmm. um, things that have been coming up politically or just, um, I don't want to get too much into it, but if, if, if you align yourself with those things that don't specifically align with your brand, your audience is very mm -hmm. much aware of They're going to see right through it and right through they'll it. tell you by not engaging anymore. Yeah. yeah. Right. And we live in a performative I mean, humans are performative. We relate to each other on how we're performing and how we're showing up. And, and when you can get away from being performative and, and instead being really authentic uh, in your approach, and so if it doesn't make sense for you to talk about these hot button items, then you shouldn't be having a conversation in that space um, or bringing up the conversation. You could add to the conversation or you could um, you know, go to someone else's 
profile or whatever and, and learn from them. But if you just perform because you think you're supposed to, um, it's never yeah. received well. It's never. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And like your brand is not, it's you as a person behind your brand um, are so much more. And I just want to say that because social media can get really uh, compare it's a comparison trap you can get so consumed by uh the need to be great at everything on social media and be well received that you start to equate your worth with your follower count or your likes or your engagement and you're so much more than that and there's a number of reasons they're just results there's just a number of reasons why social media might not be working this week for you or, or whatever. So, so um, that's always my biggest advice in, in that area is, is if you're staying on brand, you're being consistent, you're showing up, you're doing, you're doing your best and yeah. don't, don't equate your self-worth to engagement. I think that's a great point because if people discover you a little bit later, sometimes they'll scroll through to see what you've been up to and what you're mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And if it seems like you kind of gave up or, or, or you weren't there consistently, that's a real issue. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn it over to a few questions that we've gotten from the audience. Uh, first of all, how do brands best differentiate themselves in social strategy from like or similar type brands? Hmm. So, I mean, a lot of this plays into the strategy work um, that we deploy with our clients, and, and you certainly need to do it in advance of deploying anything, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, take a look at the competition, um, study uh, what they're doing, um, where they're being successful. Um, take a look at an aspirational brand. What are they doing? Where are they successful? We call um, we we start with a lot of competitive analysis and studying and, and learning. And one thing that we find, I talked about this on Monday, is that a lot of brands really um, hang their hats on their points of parity, right? So it is um, you know that they have you know they call themselves great. They say that they've got great customer service. Um, you know, their hours of operation might be a point of parity because every competitor is open from nine to five, right? So highlighting that you're open from nine to five is not something that is compelling. So really developing all those, uh, all those strategies, understanding where the competition is, and then developing your sweet spot, your points of differentiation, and then beginning to amplify that um, is really where we see, you know, a breakout um, episode can happen with social media. And we also see a lot of humor um, working very, very well, dependent upon the audience. Um, owning a season working, works very well. Responding immediately to something um, that might be happening in the marketplace with a meme that you develop, that you just don't share, mm -hmm. is another way to be really relative. A relativity is something we've not talked a lot about. Uh, yeah. And relativity outside of the political sphere is something that can be very, very strong for brands. Um, all of the brands we work with don't want to be political, um, which is a good thing um, because it, you know, that that could be a downward spiral if you're too small a brand um, to be able to withstand the potential backlash of that. Um, but those are, you know, just some things from a strategy standpoint that we think through um, that ultimately can help you differentiate. And then again, we've talked about this, but staying on brand after that, um, making sure that when someone sees that quippy comment or that campy look and feel, they know it's you. And campy can be a great strategy, right? If if you're competing with some that someone who's super sophisticated going into it, you know, with a little bit more you know, uh, personality, personality, yeah, can can be a great approach. Great, great. Another question, how bold should brands be on traditional social platforms? Do you have any good examples of things that you've worked on? My very fast answer to this is that if it makes sense for you, and that's your personality or your brand's personality, then sure. But if it's not, then don't, no, you're not, you don't, again, don't be performative just because you think it works for someone else. It might work great for them because that's naturally who they are. If it's, if it's, if you're an introvert, let's say, and, and you're not going to be show, showing your self on reels or stories or, or video, and then all of a sudden you are, and it's so awkward and you're just, and you're not getting it because you, it's not you. So don't force something unless it, it, it makes sense for your brand. Well, and I, it, bold is a, is an interesting term because I'm not, I would want more information about like how they, what they mean by that. But 
I mean, that could very well be that differentiator. Um, you know, there, there's a company that we work with who is up against some very stale competition and dropping an F-bomb every now and again in their content really resonates with people and it really sets them apart from the competition because they aren't doing that. Um, and to your point earlier of having become invisible because those, those other brands, those competitor brands have stayed so consistent and, and with no changing whatsoever, people don't see it anymore. So we say go bold or go home. <laughs> I mean, truly, we uh, one of our filters is, you know, does this client want to be bold? Do they want to be different? Or do they want to fit into the, the mainstream approach to everything? And, and this is why we're, I mean, we turn brands away who, who don't feel, you know, that, that don't have that mantra. Because our, because we're an integrated firm, we're also very attached to top line revenue and what those KPRs are and what the, the goals are. Um, and without um, differentiating yourself in a bold way, and bold can be defined very differently, but what we do know, it's not boring, right? Like if you, um, if you want to be a boring brand, sure, you can do that, um, but you're just not going to be, you're not gonna grow very fast. The bolder you are, the faster we will grow that brand. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, even get them to the point of a massive acquisition or a sale, which, which we did last year with an aerospace brand that we started with about seven years ago. Um, and they knew that they did not want to be in, you know, in, in the sea of sameness is what we refer to it as. And we grew them, we grew their look and feel. Um, we became very bold with our messaging. And you know, seven years later, they were acquired, and that was the goal, and that's why why we took that approach with them. I think just to bring this all full circle and um, to look at your shirt there that says "Hey, girl, hey," um, it's really all about word of mouth and having content that people will remember. And I think nothing's more flattering than having content that someone remembers and wants to tell a friend. Right? That is how we start growing the brand and that is authentic if i hear it from lori i'm gonna really value it because it was something that she remembered enough and cared to to to, to um to put out there uh to um those that we trust um so hey girl hey if you haven't seen that um here at startup for uh, or at startup week we're really trying to talk about what does that word of mouth and how powerful can it be um so in other sessions or tomorrow, if you type into the chat, hey girl, hey, we have some uh, wonderful things that will happen to you. Um, and you could tell your friends to uh, type up hey girl, hey as well. Um, we have fantastic sponsors. So you would get a $20 gift card to ARC thrift stores. And you would also be um, entered in drawings for other gift cards from Specialty Appliance and from Downtown Longmont. So hey girl, hey, go ahead and tell your friends about how wonderful uh, not only startup week is but word of mouth and uh, getting your message out that way so we have about two more minutes if anyone has any final words or um, advice or things they'd like to share with our great audience today well I was supposed to make this up um, I was so activated by this board of mouth marketing for the hey girl hey thing that I made myself a t-shirt <laughs> hey hey. um, because I was so excited about it and I love our thrift store so I'm I'm a compulsive thrift thrifter um, and so I think that's you know this it's such a great example of everything that we spoke about today mm -hmm. um, that and to your point about hearing it from another person, there's so much more value in that than hearing it directly from the businesses themselves. Yeah. You know, if Arc Thrift Store was the only person telling you that this thing was happening, it's not quite as meaningful as us telling you or as you telling your friends. So I think it really is key. And that's a whole growth strategy right there, um, really leaning into the word of mouth. Yeah, it's an awareness strategy, right? Um, and when we can get people to talk about it and it comes with that, um, that uh, you know, the respect um, that you bring to the table when you are talking about it, it really does help amplify um, the brand and ultimately where they want to take um, the promotion or, you know, the product that they're selling. Awesome. 
Well, I just want to thank our wonderful panel. This was fantastic information, and uh, thank you all so much for being here. Coming up next, if you can stay, we talked a lot about a brand and a strong brand, so a roadmap to a strong brand from Left Hand Brewing's perspective. So that is our next. If you can come back at 2 o'clock, I think it'll be fantastic. Again, none of this could be possible without our fantastic sponsors, so I want to thank our platinum sponsors, Arc Thrift Stores, Avaset Communications, Ward Electric Company, and the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Our gold sponsors, Biz West, Left Hand Brewing, and Dockettly. Um, our connected sponsors, Downtown Longmont and High Plains Bank. And our in-kind sponsors who are so fantastic, um, Hard Print Inc., Circle Graphics, Sticker Giant, and Chop 5. Remember this afternoon, we do have some in-person events, so we would all love to see you in person tonight from 4 to 7. Please join us at a network happy hour at Abbott and Wallet Distilling um, at uh, 350 Terry, uh, so please join us there. Um, and another networking happy hour at Cycle Hops, uh, at the Cycle Hops Bike Cantina at 600 South Airport Road. Uh, so thank you all. We hope to see you again later today. You've heard the saying, dance like no one's watching. It's easy to blend in and go unnoticed. But what if you let go? What if you march to your own beat? It takes guts. It's uncomfortable at first. But for those who have done it, they'll tell you it's freeing. And it can take you to places you've never been before. Isn't that why you do what you do in the first place? The time has come to dance like no one's watching. To lead, not follow. To ignore the status quo. The time has come to go boldly.
Hi, welcome to Longmont Startup Week. We're so glad you could join us today. My name is Kimberly this. McKee. I am Just the Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority um, here in Longmont. And then uh, we're thrilled to be working so uh, with you, everyone to bring this fantastic Startup Week to you. Today we are here to talk about um, a roadmap for building a strong brand. And we are so fortunate to have Jill Preston with us. Jill is the Director of Marketing and Hospitality at Left Hand Brewing. Um, and she has put together some fantastic information that I personally can't wait to hear. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jill to tell us a little bit about herself and to jump right into how we all build strong brands. All right, well, thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure being here today for Longmont Startup Week. Um, again, my name is Jill Preston. I'm the Director of Marketing and Hospitality at Left Hand Brewing Company. Um, I've been with Left Hand for three and a half years, um, but I've been a resident of Longmont since 2004. So I've definitely seen a lot of changes and growth throughout the years, which is really exciting. And of course, so much of that is tied to startups and entrepreneurs coming to Longmont because we have a great place to live. Um, prior to coming to Left Hand, I was in restaurant marketing for about 20 years, working with different brands that you're probably familiar with, um, Noodles and Company, Snarf Sandwiches, Red Robin, Panera Bread, Chipotle, and um, really started with a lot of those brands when they were very young and, and helped them grow. So that's definitely a part of what I love to do and my um, background. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump on in. Oops, sorry about that. Hopefully it's still sharing here. Yes, a roadmap to a strong brand. And someone, some of you might be wondering, and if you know Left Hand, well, wow, you know, Left Hand's been around for almost 28 years. <laughs> it's certainly not a startup. But at one point, we absolutely were a startup. And I would say that as a brand continues to grow, it's always important to reevaluate your brand and where you're at. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But really, the goal in this presentation is for me to share with you our case study of our brand refresh we've done over the past few years. And hopefully, you can walk, with, walk away with a few tangibles and some nuggets to really help you with where you're at right now with your businesses. All right. I love to start with this quote from our founder and um, President Eric Wallace. Um, Flavor driven, employee driven, and community driven. We take a hands on approach in all that we do. And we're proud of everything we stamp our left hand on. This really embodies who left hand is as a brand. And what's really cool about this is this quote really comes from the brand work and the consumer research work that we've done recently. Um, so this will definitely tie back to this quote, which I'll, I'll show you through this presentation. So where did it all begin? I think it's really important to start at the beginning of the story to kind of show where we were and where we've been and where we are today. Um, so you can see this picture here. Um, our founders do not look like this anymore. <laughs> um, this is uh, Eric Wallace and Dick Dorr in the early 90s um, on our spot in Boston Avenue. But it all started in the early 90s with a humble homebrew kit and the drive to make better beer. So back in the 90s, there were not a lot of beer choices out there. So tired of the same bland and dated choices everywhere, Air Force friends Eric Wallace and Dick Dorr, they both went to the Air Force, set out to make the kind of beer they wanted to drink, a beer that excited them. And this hobby really quickly became an obsession. And it wasn't long before Left Hand Brewing was born in 1993 in Longmont, Colorado. Oops, sorry. <laughs> this keeps wanting to jump. And um, this was really just the beginning for craft beer. In 1993, there were less than 450 craft breweries. And today there are close to 9,000. So back then, craft beer was the brand. Um, it was a major disruptor with what was currently on the shelves. So not to say it was easy in those days, but really we opened up and, and people came. And there was a lot of growth in those early years. So back then, we weren't really thinking about the brand and what we are and what we mean, um, because at the time, it was so new and innovative just to be a craft brewery. Sorry, this keeps doing that. All right. 
So some historical milestones. We actually enjoyed, you know, a lot of success during those early years and currently. I'm not going to read through all of these, but in 1994, our first beer we ever made, which was Sawtooth Amber Ale, and you can get it into our in our tasting room now, actually won gold at our very first Great American Beer Festival. Um, in 2011, um, we really changed craft beer history when we introduced Milk Stout Nitro um, in a bottle. And um, that has really become um, our flagship at, at Left Hand and that style of beer, nitro, and that innovation. In 2015, we became an ESOP and again, have just had a lot of wonderful success throughout our history. This is our current distribution, just to show you where we're at. We're almost in all 50 states, we're getting close. Um, we also have uh, our beer in a lot of um, countries outside of the US as well. So a lot of growth. During this time also, it was so important for us to focus on giving back. That's really been a part of our DNA. Um, Eric and Dick always talked about changing the world one pint at a time. So in 2015, we launched the Left Hand Brewing Foundation, and hopefully some of you have enjoyed our events that we have that raise money for local nonprofits, like Long Monk Oktoberfest, Left of Palooza, um, this really just is a key part of who we are, and uh, you'll hear more about this um, when we get into our consumer research. In addition, from a community standpoint, um, as we grew, we were also able to give back to other organizations, and one of that is the National MS Society. So we have a bike riding group, Team Left Hand. It includes eight teams across the country and 600 riders and volunteers. And over the years, we have raised more than $5 million for the National MS Society. We also launched a beer, um, a wonderful um, raspberry and lemon peel goza called Wheels Goes Round. That's an awareness beer for the National MS Society. So clearly in our 28 year history, we've been able to do a lot. We've been able to give back and, and it's been great. Um, but I will tell you, competition has come. <laughs> so why is branding so important now? As I mentioned, when we first started, there were less than 500 breweries. Now we're close to 10,000 breweries. And if you go down any um, liquor store shelf or in a grocery store, you see a lot. You see a lot of brands, you see a lot of names, uh, local brew pubs are popping up all over the place. And I will tell you that Left Hand and other regional breweries like us started to see sales slip because there's competition. People wanna check out what's new. And we really, as I mentioned earlier, had never really talked about our brand formally. What are the things that people love about us? What don't they give us credit for? What should we lean into? What should we focus on? And another thing which is really interesting is that our logo over the years really hasn't changed much. Um, I'll talk a little, bit of, uh, a little bit through this. So in the early 90s, um, and this is something some people may not know, Left hand, um, we were originally gonna call our brewery Indian Peaks Brewing, um, but there was another brewery in Boulder who had a beer called Indian Peaks, and they reached out to us and said, hey, is there any way that you can't do Indian Peaks? We really don't want there to be confusion, and Eric and Dick were like, yeah, you know, that's fine. We'll think about something else. So at the time, they were living in Niawat, and Niawat um, is named after Chief Niawat and translates into left hand. So obviously that's why around Longmont you see left hand canyon, a lot of businesses with left hand. So as you can see here, our original logo in the early 90s um, definitely had more of a Native American inspiration and it was definitely more intricate. As we went into bottling, you wanna put that logo on a bottle cap or a crown as we call it. And if you were to shrink that down, it would be very, very difficult to read. So Dick and Eric were like, you know what? It's probably time that we update our logo. And they talked to a lot of people, did a lot of brainstorming. And finally, Dick put his hand down and he traced it and said, this is it. <laughs> this is left hand. And actually, we still have that piece of paper in our archives, which is pretty cool. So we changed that iconic red hand um, in 1996. But as you can see from 1996 to really 2014 and beyond, um, there hasn't been a lot of changes. In 2011, we actually took away the line around the hand, 
just because from a registration standpoint and trying to print on cans, it was it was difficult. But that line was part of the story about the hand trace. So we brought it back in 2014, but not a big change. In addition, we also created a banner logo, one that could be you know, shrunk down, put in some different places, but really those two logos were, were very different and again, had been around for a long time. We also looked at other breweries, um, our friends in craft beer and looked at their logo evolutions as well. And one that I love to point out here is Stone, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with being a, a big national brand. The very first logo was very detailed. It has the gargoyle. Um, it has the location, but over the years, you can see how it has been simplified to what you see today, stone brewing with the gargoyle. You can see that with others as well. You look at Oscar Blues, who is also here in Longmont, and how their logo has just been more simplified. And that's because when you walk down that liquor store and you're looking at the shelf, there's so many options. And you definitely want to make sure that your brand, it's clear who you are and what you're about. So those intricate designs have definitely been scaled down and have been replaced by logos that are much more legible um, and really kind of get down to that core of what brands are about. So in looking at that, we decided it's probably time to go back to the beginning and to really think about our brand and who we are. Um, so what is a brand anyway? Um, you know, we're all very familiar with Starbucks and McDonald's and you see these logos, but a brand is really much more than a brand name or a logo. A brand is really what your customer or your prospective customer thinks of you when she hears or he hears your brand name. So your brand already has a personality within someone's own, someone's own mind, and it's different with different people. So it's everything the public thinks it knows about your brand offering, both factual and emotional. Um, your brand name exists objectively, people can see it, it's fixed, but your brand also exists in someone's mind. So as we thought more about this, really thinking about a brand is, of course, what you do and say, but also how people feel. And the customer should really be the focus of the brand. It's there in the middle. And even though we had been in business for almost 26 years before we started this work, we had never done any customer research when it came to our brand. Now we would ask people, hey, what do you think of our beer? What do you think of this? And they'd give us feedback, but we had never really asked people again, what is it about left hand that you love? What is it about left hand you'd love to see more of? How do you, how do you talk about left hand when you think about our brand? And we thought, you know what, it's time. Um, with where things were at um, in craft beer with the competition, it's time for us to go back to the beginning and really think about who, we're, who we are. So what is brand strategy? It's your company's position in the market and in people's minds. It should be favorable, differentiated, and credible. Things that you can stand for that people believe. And it really is that compass that guides all of our decisions. So how do we get there? And I could spend probably an hour talking about each one of these areas. Um, but for the sake of our time today, I'm going to focus on a couple of these areas. But it really starts with research. It's really doing a brand audit, looking at everything that you have out there, talking to your fans, talking to our shareholders, doing some market analysis, looking at what others are doing, and then really taking all of that and, and developing that into a strategy, refining that, that focus. What is our brand promise? What is our positioning in the market? Um, and then that moves into design, and we'll talk a lot about that today. And then that moves into every touch point in your company should tie back to that brand look and feel and positioning making sure every asset that you then introduce ties back to that. So it's holistic. And then the circle keeps going. So we did not do this all on our own. We actually, our approach involved partnering with a gentleman named Tim Shanahan with the Shanahan Advisory. He has 30 years of brand strategy and innovation work, primarily in the food and beverage industry. 
So in October of 2018, we sat down with him and said, hey, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to learn and why. And he really helped us create a framework to get at that information. Um, it involved a, a real immersive section, um, a kickoff with different people in the brewery. We reviewed all of our documents, things we've done in the past. He did interviews with our leadership, with our distributors, with our fans. In addition to that qualitative research, we also did quantitative research. And this is the first time that we had ever done this, where we did surveying and we talked to people nationwide who were craft beer drinkers, some of which who knew us, some of which didn't. And we really were able to get so much rich data about what people thought about left hand, craft beer, and where our focus should be. So like I said, we got a lot of incredible information um, from this research. And here are some of the things that we learned that were very interesting. So we're a national brand. We're almost in 50 states. We've been around for 26 years. And we have brand awareness challenges. We're like, what? 11% of craft beer consumers were left-hand aware by name only. Meaning when we asked, are you familiar with left-hand brewing company? Only 11% said yes. Now, when we showed them our logo in our hand, that was a different story. Oh yeah, I, I, recognize, I recognize that. It's that Red Hand Brewery. Oh, it's that Nitro Brewery. You guys do Nitro. What we learned was the red and the hand were key but we really need to increase the visibility of left hand. And if you look at our logo um, at the time, you can see that left hand brewing company in Longmont, Colorado, same size, same font. Um, and actually when you shrink it down, it's really hard to read. <laughs> so similar problem that we had back in the early nineties that we thought that we solved. In addition, we learned at the time, our tagline was employee owned, righteously independent. And those are key things about us. But there's other breweries, other brands out there that are employee owned and that are independent. So that tagline was moderately appealing, but and some people even actually thought it was kind of a turnoff because um, it really didn't talk about what left hand's about. And it came off as a little self-righteous, which we were like, wow, did not know that. What else we learned is that our customers and our distributors really wanted to understand more about our history and who we are and the meaning behind our name and logo. Um, and something also that was interesting for us when thinking about beer innovation, what styles do we wanna go into? What do we wanna do? Everyone loves IPAs, um, but that nitro, milk stout nitro, um, you know, where we had really built a lot around our brand on that, truly was an area for us to continue to innovate, that people wanted to see more from us. They wanted to have you know, nitro, not just as a stout, but in different styles as well, which was definitely a disruptor. You, you don't see that a lot. But then on the flip side, we also learned people are like, well, what is nitro? 55% of craft beer respondents weren't familiar with what, what that is. And we thought, wow, that's a real education opportunity as well. Um, Something also that we learned that really reinforced that kind of community DNA is that consumers were even more motivated to support local breweries and those they gave back to the community. So that was something that we always thought was so important, but we heard that firsthand in our qualitative and quantitative research that that really makes a difference when people are buying things on the shelf. And then also, and we heard this a lot from our employees. From day one, our employees really wanna understand what the left-hand brand means, what it means to be left-hand. So, first thing I'm gonna talk about is we went through a logo refresh. You can see here our logo on the left and now our new logo on the right. And I will tell you when I sat down with Eric Wallace, our founder and said, hey, we want to change the logo. He was like, okay, we'll see about this. But we were able to go back to the research and point out that when you shrink this down, people are not seeing it. People are not tying left hand to the hand. So it took 
several months in lots of different iterations, but we did um, refresh our logo to what you're seeing on the right. It's a really modern, fresh take on our logo. Obviously, left-hand brewing is much more visible, even in a smaller format. And something kind of cool is you can see in our original logo, the two like bullet points <laughs> were replaced by diamonds. And that pays homage to our original logo in the 90s that had more of that diamond look. Also, if you go to our tasting room, you will see that there's a window that's a diamond and that's Eric's office. And that's just always been a part of our brewery. So that kind of is some cool storytelling. Also, you see that we took out Longmont, Colorado as well. Longmont is very important to us, but we are a national brand. So in addition, we created a local version that had CO and 93 that speaks to we're from Colorado, we're proud, and that we were founded in 1993. In addition, we created a whole logo system. And this is so important when you're thinking about a logo for your brand, thinking about, well, how am I going to use this? And where are all the places that I'm going to use it? Because you might find, like we did, that one first cool logo you design isn't going to be applicable in all the places that you want it to be. So we created a system. They all look a little different, but they all also kind of ladder up to that overall look and feel. In addition, we changed our tagline. As I mentioned before, it was employee owned, righteously independent. We did a lot of uh, brainstorming and we came up with what we think is a wonderful tagline and represents us. And that's from our hand to yours. Um, it really gives more meaning to our left hand in our logo as people wanted. It implies handcrafted because that's so important to us. As we continue to grow, we still do things by hand. We still use our hands. We are not an automated brewery. And then left hand really becomes that stamp of approval for quality and integrity. As I mentioned in Eric's quote at the beginning, that when we put our hand on it, we are giving to you, we are basically saying, this is, the, this is the best beer, we are proud of this, and we are excited for you to enjoy it. And then finally, it reinforces our community commitment and hands-on approach. Um, so going from employee-owned, righteously independent, from our hand to yours, very, very different. Um, but we felt like this really represented who we are. Packaging. <laughs> This is where we were probably in 2019. And as you can see here, you can see our logo on these cans. And even here, you can see it's very hard to read left hand brewing around. In addition, we knew it was time to really think about streamlining our packaging as well, because there are so many brands on the shelf. Our style was very illustrative, as you can see here. We're really known for our illustration. But what we wanted to do was take those elements streamline them so they were more visible for people when they were on the shelf. Oops. So you can see how this packaging on at the bottom has transitioned into where we are today. It's a much cleaner look. You can actually read left hand even from this vantage point. We've definitely kept some of that fun illustrative design, but we've also simplified it and made it more modern. And we've taken this and applied this to our entire beer lineup. Even though we started this research in 2018, it's interesting how long it takes to get things rolled out in retail. It's only been this year in 2021 that we've actually seen all of our packages redesigned out in the stores. Um, if you know anything about, about beer, it just, it takes time from a R&D standpoint, testing it, um, from working with our um, producers on getting the cans. Usually it takes about a year or more from start to finish. And some beers, you know, we're already talking about 2023 right now. Um, so really the fruits of our labor in terms of this brand refresh, we're really just starting to realize it now. So something that I certainly, um, I'm saying it's last, but certainly not least, 
is our employees. And how do we get people on board from the very beginning in terms of who we are, what we're about? Part of this work that we did um, with the consumer research, we took what we learned and we also really changed the way we talk about ourselves, the copy that we're using, making sure we're hitting on things that people want to hear. So what we did is we created what's called a brand manifesto. So we worked with a really talented copywriter and we looked at all of the research and all of the words and the things that people were saying about left hand. And we developed a manifesto, which I'll read to you, that we talked to with our whole company. When new employees come and start at left hand, we read this to them, we talk about it because it really embodies who we are and what we're about. So it is called the What's Best Manifesto. So what's best? It all depends on how you measure it. If you measure yourself against others, you're at the mercy of what's new, not what's good. So at left hand, we only measure what's best against the highest standards, ours. That way we know what's best is our best. What's best is putting our heart, soul, and experience into every can. What's best is letting our beer nerd flag fly. And this was one of our beer tenders and she actually had this tattoo before she started working for us. What's best is being our biggest fans and our harshest critics. What's best is pride and stamping the big left hand on the fruits of our labors. What's best is hand smoking, hand juicing, and hand crafting. What's best is what we feel, what we know, and what we do. What's best is giving back where we live, work, and play. What's best is a big helping left hand to fight MS with our legs, not just our wallets. Because better beer, truly better beer, doesn't just come from select hops, grains, yeast, and water. Left hand is damn good beer because of damn good people. People who believe in hard work, good times, great beer, and always what's best. Um, it was funny when we gave this presentation a few months ago or in the last year, I would stop at this picture and say, I can't wait till we get back to not being able to wear, you know, to not being wearing masks anymore. Um, so it, it is really cool um, for us as a company to be able to get back. Um, but like I said, this manifesto really drives who we are. Um, as I mentioned, we talk about it from day one with our employees. And it really represents who we are, not only from things that we believe, but what our customers told us, which is so important. So some key takeaways um, as you're listening to this, you know, it is never too early or too late to evaluate your brand. So whether you're thinking about launching a brand, you've been in business for a couple years, or you're like left hand and been in business for 28 years, it's so important to always be looking at what you're saying, how you're saying it, how you're personifying yourself out there, asking people, what do you think? Um, brands must remain relevant. And, and we see that. If you don't remain relevant and with the changing times, brands do die, which is unfortunate. You know, in the beer world, you know, styles change all the time. Right now, there are so many different beers out there. And you always have to think about, of course, what the consumer is looking for. But what are your strengths? What are the things that you do well that you can deliver upon? Because otherwise, you're always going to be chasing that next trend. And what we found out through our research is nitro and nitro beers for us is really the place that people wanna see innovation from us. And over the past few years, we have introduced more nitro beers and styles than we had leading up to our history. Um, after learning about this research, we actually launched a beer called Flamingo Dreams Nitro. 
and it is a berry blonde ale that is nitrogenated and nitrogenated beers um, they use nit nitrogen, so the bubbles are a little bit smaller. It produces a creamier mouthfeel. Um, it's very, very drinkable. But people, like I said, associate them with stouts. We introduced Flamingo Dreams, and it was the second best launch we've ever had next to our original Milk Stout Nitro launch. And if you've never had that beer, please come to our tasting room and try it because it is quite delicious and it pours bright pink. <laughs> also, your customer is the key to your brand. If you're not talking to them, you should be. And that's something that we realized, that we've been in business this whole time. And of course, you're always asking people, hey, what do you think, this and that? But we had never really sat down and dug into what people thought was special about left hand or maybe a direction that we shouldn't go. Um, so I just highly encourage you, if you're not, you should be. And also know that that budget is not a reason not to do this important work. I do realize as a startup that budgets are small. I, I understand that even as left hand as a regional brewery, you know, we're, we're conservative, we're watching our dollars, we, we get it. But there's things that you can do um, outside of taking on a consumer research you know, project with a partner, there are definitely things that you can be doing as a startup. And some of those things are small focus groups, you know, whether that's friends, family, people that are coming to you, some of your initial customers, sitting down with them, saying, hey, what do you think? Let me run this by you. Um, talking to others in the industry who have been where you are before talking to folks like like myself who have been through it, like sit down and talk to people and see what they think. Surveys are a really easy way to do that too. Um, if you have a social media presence or if you have an email distribution group, asking people regularly, you know, what are you looking for from us? Um, you know, what's, what's a new idea that we might consider? Um, what are we doing in that we shouldn't, you know, what are we doing that we shouldn't be doing or vice versa? Social media feedback. I mean, that is so much now where, of course, people are, especially, you know, during this um, very interesting time. More people are online than ever before. So starting up that following on your social media channels right away and making sure that you're also engaging with those people, right? Social media is social, it's a conversation. So what a great way from the very beginning to grow that fan base, ask them questions, respond to them, get them involved. Um, they wanna hear from you. That's why they're choosing to, to like you. One-on-one um, -on -one conversations um, with fans. I mean, we learned so much from talking to our beer club members, people who've been coming to us for years. Um, but really saying, hey, what do you think? But doing it in a little bit more formal setting um, and letting them talk. We just, we learned so much. Some of it is it reinforced the things that we already knew, but some of it were things that we hadn't even thought of before. So that was incredibly valuable. So like I said, even, you know, having a limited budget, um, shouldn't stop you from talking to your customer and really understanding what they're looking for as you're building your brand, your logo, your tagline, how you communicate, keep them involved in the process. Because truly, as I mentioned at the beginning, your brand really is your, your compass and your roadmap to success. Um, it's so important that you are consistent, that you pay attention to that brand and that you make sure what you're communicating and how you're communicating is going across all of your different touch points from your website to your packaging, if that's applicable, to people coming into your retail store, whatever that might be, that needs to be consistent. Um, and hopefully from this presentation, there's some, like I said, nuggets, some things that you've seen um, that you think would be applicable to what you're doing um, with your new business. Um, so thank you. I appreciate everyone uh, for listening, for being a part of this. Um, Left Hand, it, it has been amazing to be a part of the Longmont community for as long as we have. Um, I mean, we, we 
we, we just we just love Longmont and we love all of our fans and um, just so appreciate being here. Like I said, we we were a startup 26 years ago. Longmont looked very different than it does today, um, but we're excited to be here for another 28 years. So thank you very much. Great, Jill. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and informative and I loved every minute of it. Um, a few of the key takeaways that I really saw is it does take some courage, right? You have to have some courage to really lay all of that out there and to ask those questions in a brand that I think many of us would have felt is so established because we're used to the hand. But I think living here, we would know what it meant. But um, I, thought, I mean, I just thought that was extraordinarily interesting information. Yeah. And the manifesto literally gave me chills. Oh, and I have you. really thought, what a fantastic thing for anyone who is building their brand to make it very clear and very understandable that this is what we're about. Um, and also the ability to change a tagline. One of the things that I think is so hard, and you had mentioned it a little bit that when you said to Eric, we're going to do this, he's <laughs> like, yeah, we'll see. Right. And, and I think that's always the answer, but I think it's the research yes. and the uh, you non-defeatable data that that helps make those decisions so a absolutely and um eric is a data person and you know when he saw that data and that information and knew that we weren't going to do something radical <laughs> and completely sure. change course he was incredibly supportive and with a manifesto what's so cool about that is that's something anybody can do um and then it's something that, you know, like you said, you can share with your employees, with with potential partners, and they really get a sense of, of who you are as a company. Absolutely. We did get some questions that came in. So if, if it's fine, we can go Great. ahead and move to those. Um, so the first one is, how has your brand, imp and I know you said it's just now rolling out, but how has that brand refresh impacted sales? Yeah. Such a great question. And we were actually very fortunate that we did this work before the pandemic. Of course, we couldn't have known that at the time. But all of our packaging, our logo, um, everything that we've done really started hitting shelves right when the pandemic started in 2020. So what happened during that time, of course, is that everyone you know, wasn't going out anymore. They weren't, you know, going to their local, you know, tap room and getting a beer. They were rushing to their liquor stores, to their grocery stores and pantry buying. So it was so important more than ever to make sure that our packaging stood out on that shelf and that we were clearly communicating what we have to offer, who we are. So that was just really the, the perfect timing. Um, the pandemic was tough. I mean, it's been tough for everybody, um, certainly for on-premise business, meaning your restaurants, your bars, your tap rooms. Um, but because of our strong brand, and I really believe because of the work that we did, we actually did very well um, during the pandemic when it came to sales at liquor stores, at grocery stores. Um, our package sales were up, um, you know, almost 10, 15%. Um, now, did it take away from the business that we didn't get <laughs> when things were closed? No, but it enabled us to have a really, you know, decent year despite the pandemic and everything that we had to deal with. Awesome. Well, we did get a comment that says such a great talk, loved learning more about Left Hand's journey as a company. Uh, so here's a question though, if you're a small business, what brand strategies do you recommend that don't require a huge budget? Sure. Um, first of all, digital and social media, 100%. Um, that is where people are. So I think it's incredibly important that you establish your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, perhaps TikTok, um uh platforms um and that's the first way that you can start engaging with people you can spend a very limited amount of money on advertising even 25 dollars for a post and it's amazing how many people that you can get engaging with you 
So I think from, from day one, having that digital strategy, um, because the tools are right there for you. But what's important also is that when you start to develop those fans and you start interacting, that you need to keep that up consistently. Because what you don't want to do is get started and then kind of drop off and then nobody's hearing from you. So I think that that's a really effective and, and um, cost effective way to begin marketing. And that's really where we spend the majority of our of our dollars um, is through digital marketing, social media marketing. You know, we don't do a lot of traditional advertising because let's face it, it it's expensive. Um, other things that we do, and this is appropriate for our business, and now that things are opening back up, it's really that grassroots experience. So we like to go to festivals, right? We like to go to a community events. We like to donate our beer. We like to be there talking about it. Um, those are all things that you can do that don't have, you know, big budget items aside from, you know, you donating and bringing your product. So those are some initial things that I would recommend if, of course, you're on a budget. Great, fantastic. So do you think there is a certain lifespan for a brand or logo or mark when you should look to refresh or other cues um, that would suggest it's time? Yeah, um, I think it really depends on your industry. Um, you know, for us, we had our logo for 20 years and it did great things from us, that, that red hand. Um, however, because of the increase in competition in craft beer, we knew it was time. And because of that research, we knew we weren't getting the credit um, that we needed to be for our brand name. So I think it's going to be dependent upon your industry, depending upon the competition. Um, but I will say that if you look at businesses that have been around, you know, for 20, 25 years, and you look at your logo, their logos, you'll see a lot of them have adjusted over the years, not enough where they're not discernible anymore. Um, but they've been adjusted because when people are used to kind of seeing you for a long time, and then there's a change, it's like, oh, what? And, and that's what we're finding as well, is that, you know, with our brand refresh and our new look, people are like, oh, yeah, left hand, that's right. Because after a while, things kind of become wallpaper for people. You constantly see them. You make some small tweaks, and it really can make a big difference. So, you know, in terms of timing, again, depending upon your business, but I would definitely say, you know, every couple of years, I think it's a good thing to take another look at your logo to see how it's working from you, get some feedbacks and opinions from people. If that logo isn't working on certain things for you, whether it be on a t-shirt or whether it be on a product that you have, then it might be time to, to look at making some tweaks. You know, some of the fascinating things that I think from your talk was that initial logo was created to be on top of a bottle cap, right? And how you evolved it to have a suite of all types of different ways that you're going to have to use it. Um, and also really the authenticity of the tracing. And I'm glad you brought that back. <laughs> and I would have never thought of that. But what a great story. Yes. In the last session, we talked about a story that you want to tell your friend. I want to tell my friends that story. <laughs> so the research, I think, um, and the stories are really important. One of the things I thought you could touch a little bit more on is you talked about um, how you create a brand and it, it's what people are thinking. When you did your research, you talked to your distributors, yes. you talked to the restaurateurs that, and I think that's such an interesting, did you see a huge disparity of what a customer thought as a distributor? Was it consistent? Did you learn different things from different audiences? Yeah, no, we, we, we absolutely did. Um, you know, distributors, if you're not familiar with the beer industry, once you read a, reach a certain barrelage, you sell your beer to a distributor who then sells it to restaurants, bars, what have you. So essentially in marketing and in sales, you're marketing not only to the end user, but you're also marketing to that distributor because that distributor has 2,500 brands other beer brands, of course, your competition that they're marketing as well. So getting our distributors involved, getting their opinions was so important because then they're going to start telling those stories as well. So from our distributors, we really heard a lot about narrowing your focus, leaning into what you do well, um, not chasing every trend that's out there. 
of course, from our consumers, we heard, oh yeah, we want all these new beers, <laughs> right? <laughs> we want the newest flavor for this and that. And, um, and that was, of course, interesting too, because it also meant that our consumers don't just think about us because we're known a lot for stouts and darker beers and nitro, that they do want other things from us from a portfolio standpoint. But then our distributors, like, let's narrow and focus. So that really helped us from an innovation standpoint on, on where we should focus. And I will say what we do nationally is very different than what we do here in Colorado. So in our tap room, I mean, we have 30 different taps. We have all sorts of different beers. Um, in Colorado, you can find so many of our brands. But as you go further out, that's where we really narrow our focus to what we're known for and what we do well. So stouts, nitro, um, because in other communities, it's a lot of times those local breweries, you know, that people want as well. So I think for us, it really helped us um, develop a strategy that makes sense here in our backyard in Colorado, and then as we continue to expand. Um, but yeah, the feedback was was really interesting. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, when you've been around for a long time, you tend to be kind of hard on yourself, you know, and what was really wonderful was just all the positive feedback we got. And we were like, yeah, you know, we, we we're doing it. And um, we felt really good about that. So great. Well, we only have a few minutes left, uh, but we'd love to know uh, what's on the horizon for left hand. Yeah, you know, what's really exciting is during this this time over the last year or two, um, you know, we knew that we were going to need to diversify and think about doing some new things. And it was a big opportunity. So um, we are going to be opening a beer garden on our campus here in Longmont, right next to the tasting room. Um, it has an outdoor uh, bar with six taps and cans. Um, it, it, it's a garden environment. You can hang out. We're going to have live music. And we are going to be opening that later this month, which is really exciting, continuing to grow. And then we're actually taking our brand on the road, and we are opening a location in Denver um, next spring. And it's going to be literally across the street from the Mission Ballroom in River North. Um, it is an area that is developing, and we are so excited to be one of the um, um, first tenants that are going to be there. So not only will we be doing beer, but we're going to be opening a restaurant. So that's going to be a really um, a new venture for us. Um, it is a beautiful place. Like I said, it's going to be opening um, hopefully um, early next spring. But for people that are going back to concerts there, um, they're going to have a great place to come and hang out. We'll have live music. We'll have festivals. Um, so we're excited about that. And then finally, one more thing. Um, you know, last year we weren't able to do a lot of our um, events and the, the fun uh, beer fests and things that we do here in Longmont. But on September 25th, we are bringing back Longmont Oktoberfest at Roosevelt Park. It'll be from 11 to 9. We're going to have live music, fun, steinholding activities. Um, it's something we've done for the past 10 years, so we're really excited to bring it back. And um, the money raised will go to our foundation and a woman's work, um, a wonderful um, nonprofit organization that uh, supports women in our community. Wonderful. Well, Jill, thank you so much. This was so informative and um, loved hearing more about the left hand story. And so thanks for all you do and all that you all do for our community. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, tomorrow up next, we really hope that you can join us tomorrow for the final day of Startup Week, and you'll be glad you did. Um, starting off uh, at 9 to 10 in the morning, we'll be having a panel discussion on um, using community-based marketing to activate, engage, and grow your uh, local, local, <laughs> local sorry, and loyal customer base. Um, from 10 o'clock, we'll be going, moving on to building a banking relationship. Uh, and then at 11 o'clock, we'll be having a panel on leveraging state and federal funding resources. So we all find that so important. Uh, so please join us. Again, a big shout out to our sponsors who have been so great. Uh, Platinum, ARC Thrift Stores, Avaset Communication, Ward Electric, and Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Our gold sponsors, BizWest, Left Hand Brewery, and Docket, Docketly. 
um, our connected sponsors, Downtown Longmont and High Plains Inc. And our in-kind sponsors, uh, Handprint Inc., Circle Graphics, Sticker Giant, and Chop 5. Please remember uh, and mark your calendars for tomorrow evening, which is our closing uh, ceremony from 4 to 7 at 300 Suns Brewing. So uh, thank you all so much, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Sipping on a blue moon Jenny's dancing 